Part two, chapter five A of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Seventeen ninety six, departure for Europe. Towards the end of the winter of seventeen ninety five and seventeen ninety six, I had the measles and was quite ill. We were afraid that Humbert also would take them, but he did not, although he slept in my room. I soon found myself in good health, and it was at this moment that we received letters from Bonny in France, which informed us that joining his efforts to those of Monsieur de Boucan, he had succeeded in having the sequestration raised at Le Bouille. The property of the persons who had been condemned had been restored. My mother-in-law, in concert with her son-in-law, the Marquis de la Mette, acting in the name of his children, again entered into possession of the estates of Tesson and Ombleville, and of the house at Saint, which the department of Charente and Ferrieux had occupied. But when they requested that the seals should be taken off at Le Bouille, the authorities objected on account of the absence of the proprietor. Our family represented that the owner was living in America with a passport, and that neither my husband nor myself who personally owned a house at Paris, had been inscribed upon the list of émigrés. After numerous discussions, they allowed us a delay of a year in which to put in a personal appearance, in default of which Le Bouille will be placed on sale as national property. Our friends therefore urged us to return as soon as possible. Nevertheless, as the stability of the French government inspired even at this time very little confidence, they recommended us at the same time not to take our passage for a French port, but rather to return by way of Spain, with which the Republic had just concluded a peace which seemed likely to be durable. These dispatches fell in the midst of our tranquil occupations, like a firebrand which quickly lighted in the hearts of all around me the thought of a return to their native land. As for myself, I had an entirely different feeling. France had left in my mind only a recollection of horror. There I had lost my youth, which had been broken by terrors the remembrance of which I could not forget. I had not then and I never have had since in my mind but two feelings which entirely and exclusively mastered me, the love of my husband and of my children. Religion, the only motive now for all my actions, commanded me not to oppose the least obstacle to a departure which frightened me and cost me dear. A sort of presentiment caused me to foresee that I was going to encounter a new life of trouble and anxieties. My husband did not dream of the intensity of my regret when I saw the moment of our departure arrive. I imposed only one condition, that of giving our slaves their liberty. My husband consented and reserved for me alone this happiness. These poor people, on seeing the letters arrive from Europe, had feared some change in our life. They were disturbed and alarmed. Therefore all four of them were trembling when they entered my room to which I had called them. They found me alone. I said to them with emotion, My friends, we are going to return to Europe. What shall I do with you? The poor creatures were overcome. Judith dropped into a chair in tears, while the three men covered their faces with their hands, and all remained silent. I continued, we have been so satisfied with you that it is just that you should be recompensed. My husband has charged me to tell you that he will give you your liberty. On hearing this word, our good servants were so stupefied that they remained for several seconds without speech. Then all four threw themselves at my feet, crying, Is it possible? Do you mean that we are free? I replied, Yes, upon my honour. From this moment, as free as I am myself. 
Who can describe the poignant emotion of such a moment? Never in my life had I experienced anything so sweet. Those whom I had just promised their liberty surrounded me in tears. They kissed my hands, my feet, my dress, and then suddenly their joy ceased, and they said, We would prefer to remain slaves all our lives if you would stay here. The following day, my husband took them to Albany before a judge for the ceremony of the manumission, an act which had to be public. All the negroes of the city were present. The justice of the peace, who was at the same time the steward of Mr. Van Rensselaer, was in very bad humour. He attempted to assert that Prime, being fifty years of age, could not, under the terms of the law, be given his liberty, unless he was assured a pension of a hundred dollars. But Prime had foreseen this case, and he produced his certificate of baptism, which attested that he was only forty-nine. They made the slaves kneel before my husband, and he placed his hand upon the head of each to sanction his liberation, exactly in the manner of ancient Rome. We let our dwelling, with the land which surrounded it, to the same individual from whom we had purchased it, and we sold the greater part of our equipment. The horses brought a quite high price. I distributed by way of souvenirs several little articles in porcelain which I had brought from Europe. As for my poor Judith, I left her some old silk dresses which have without doubt been handed down to her descendants. Towards the middle of April 1796, we embarked from Albany to descend to New York. After having paid tender and thankful adieu to all those who for two years had overwhelmed us with tender thoughts, friendship, and kindness of every kind. How many times two years later, when enduring another exile, have I not regretted my farm and my good neighbours? At New York we stayed with Mr. and Mrs. Olive, who received us in their pretty little country house. Here we found Monsieur de Talleyrand, who had decided, like us, to return to Europe. Madame de Stael was back at Paris, where she was living with Benjamin Constant. She urged him to return and enter the service of the directory, which demanded the aid of his ability. For a moment he had thought that he would take his passage upon the same vessel with us, but when he learned our intention to land at a Spanish port, whence we expected to gain Bordeaux, he changed his plans and resolved to take passage on a vessel bound for Hamburg. There was no ship leaving for Coruña or for Bilbao in the north of Spain, as we would have wished. Only one boat, a superb English vessel of 400 tons, was going to Cadiz at an early date. For lack of anything better, and in spite of the long journey which we would have to make in Spain, we decided to engage our passage on this vessel. It sailed under the Spanish flag, although it, as well as the cargo, belonged to an Englishman. The proprietor, who was named Mr. Enstall, was to go as a passenger. He was an old ship-owner who had been interested in whaling. He did not know a word of French. The captain, who was originally from Jamaica, also spoke only English, but he soon found a very intelligent interpreter in my son, who, although only six years of age, was of great use to him. While occupying our time with our outfit and our arrangements for the voyage, we passed the three remaining weeks with Mrs. Olive in company with Monsieur de Talleyrand. In the harbour there was a French sloop of war commanded by Captain Barret, whose father my husband had known in the household of the old Duc d'Orléans, the father of Philippe Egalité. Although a regular sea-dog, he was a very pleasant man. He came for us every day in his boat and conducted us to every part of the harbour, taking good care never to approach Sandy Hook, where Captain later Admiral Cochrane had waited for two months to capture him if he attempted to come out. We visited his sloop, which was armed with fifteen guns. It was a jewel of order, neatness and care. How I should have loved to have returned to Europe in this fine boat! 
but the Maria Josepha awaited us. We went on board, my husband, myself, our young son Humbert and Monsieur de Chambeau, the 6th of May, 1796, and the same day we set sail. There were several other passengers on board. Among them was a Monsieur de Lavaux, an émigré, a former officer of the Constitutional Guard of Louis the Sixteenth, who had escaped from a thousand dangers at the time of the massacres of the 10th of August. As he was from Bordeaux, a kind of attachment was formed between him and my husband. Then there was a French merchant, Monsieur Tisserandot, and his wife. He had been unfortunate in business at New York and was going to make another attempt at Madrid. His wife was young, sweet, quite well brought up, but lazy. The persons whom I have just named, with Mr. Ensdell and the captain, made up the table in the large salon. I did not suffer from seasickness, and the weather being superb, I was occupied all day long. As soon as I finished the work which I had brought for my husband and myself, I then set up for a general seamstress, and announced that any one could give me work to do. Every one brought me something. I had shirts to make, cravats to hem, and linen to mark. The voyage lasted forty days, because the captain, against the advice of Mr. Ensdell, had taken a southerly course, and had been carried away by the currents. This time was sufficient for me to put the wardrobe of everybody on the boat in order. Finally, about the 10th of June, we saw Cape St. Vincent, and the next day we entered the harbour of Cadiz. The captain, by his stupidity and ignorance, had prolonged our voyage by at least 15 days by allowing himself to be carried towards the coast of Africa, whence he had a great deal of trouble in returning to the north. He believed that he was so far from land that he had not even thought of sending a sailor as a lookout to the top of the mast. When he discovered at daybreak Cape St. Vincent, which is very high, he was entirely disconcerted. We were moored alongside a French vessel with three decks, the Jupiter. It was there with a French fleet, which had been prevented from going out by the English men of war, superior in number which were cruising every day almost in sight of the port. We were visited at once by the boat of the health officer who notified us that we would be kept a week on board in quarantine. We preferred this to being sent to the Lazarette, where we would have been devoured by all the numerous insects which are so abundant in Spain. If we had been able to find a boat which was going to Bilbao or Barcelona, we should have taken passage, the voyage thus would have been shorter, less tiresome, and less expensive. The name of Monsieur de Chambeau had not been erased from the list of emigres, and he was not able to return to France. He wished to go to Madrid, where he knew several persons, but nevertheless he would have willingly accompanied us as far as Barcelona, which would have brought him quite near to Arche, a city in which he owned some property. The uncertainty of our plans formed the subject of our conversation during the quarantine, which lasted ten days, and which might have been prolonged even more on account of the desertion of one of our sailors. This man, of French nationality, had been captured in a combat upon a sloop of war. He recognised a sailor on board the Jupiter, which was moored alongside us, and spoke to him through a megaphone. That same night, he swam to the Jupiter, and when the health officer proceeded to call the roll the following morning, no trace of him could be found except his shirt and trousers. This was his whole wardrobe. This incident prolonged our quarantine until the day that it was ascertained that the fugitive was on the French vessel. The quarantine was nearly fatal to me. Every day sellers of fruit came alongside the boat and I passed my time with Madame Tisserondeau in lowering a basket by means of a cord in order to obtain figs, oranges and strawberries. Eating this fruit made me very ill. Finally, permission was received to give us our liberty. The captain put us on land 
and never in my life have I been so much embarrassed as at this moment. On landing, they ordered Madame Tisserandeau and myself to enter a little room looking out on the street, while they examined our effects with the most exaggerated minuteness. Our coloured dresses and our straw hats soon attracted a large crowd of individuals of every age and of every condition, sailors and monks, porters and gentlemen, all anxious to see what they doubtless considered to be two curious animals. As for our husbands, they had been detained in the room where our baggage was examined. We were therefore alone with my son. This indiscreet curiosity decided us, my companion and myself, immediately to dress like the Spanish women. Even before proceeding to the inn, we went to purchase black skirts and mantillas so as to be able to go out without scandalising the whole population. We stopped at the hotel which was reputed to be the best at Cadiz, but which was so dirty as to cause me the greatest discomfort, accustomed as I was to the exquisite neatness of America, and I would willingly have returned on board our boat. I happen to remember that one of the sisters of poor Theobald Dillon, massacred at Lille in 1792, had married an English merchant established at Cadiz by the name of Langton. Having written him a polite note, he came at once and was very attentive to us. At that time his wife, with his younger daughter, was at Madrid visiting a married daughter, the Baron d'Andille. Nevertheless, Mr. Langton invited us to dinner, and even wished to have us stay at his house. But we did not accept, as I was too ill to take the trouble to be polite. It was arranged that the dinner should be put off until the first day that I felt better. The day after our arrival, my husband took our passport to be visaed by the French Consul-General, he was a Monsieur de Roxant, a former Comte or Marquis, now changed into a hot Republican, if not a terrorist. He asked my husband a hundred questions and made a note of his replies. All this was very much like an examination. Then he suddenly exclaimed, Citizen, we have received today excellent news from France. That rascal Charette has finally been taken and shot. So much the worse, replied Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. He was at least a worthy man. The consul then kept silent and signed the passport, which he reminded my husband it would be necessary to present again to the French ambassador at Madrid. Later we learned the manner in which he had recommended us at Bayonne. End of Part 2, Chapter 5a Part 2, Chapter 5b of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. At this time, Spain, having concluded peace with the French Republic, had disbanded the greater part of her army, probably without paying them, the roads were infested with brigands, especially the mountains of the Sierra Morena, which we had to cross. We travelled in a convoy composed of several carriages only. We did not take any military escort, which would probably have been in league with the brigands, the former soldiers. But the mounted travellers who joined the convoy had taken the precaution to be armed to the teeth. A convoy was usually composed of from fifteen to eighteen covered chariots drawn by mules. It is thus that we set out from Cadiz. We occupied, my husband, my son and myself, one of these chariots, in which we were stretched out at full length upon our mattresses. Below in the bottom of the chariot was placed our baggage, covered with a bed of straw which filled the spaces between the trunks. A hood of cane, artistically sewn and covered by a tarpaulin, protected us from the sun during the day and from the humidity during the night, for it happened several times that we preferred the chariot to an inn. 
but in speaking so soon of our departure i have anticipated because we remained a week at cadiz every evening we walked upon the beautiful promenade of the alameda which looks out on the sea where you can breathe a little air after having endured during the day a heat of ninety five degrees a spectacle which i have never forgotten was the magnificent bullfight the day of saint jean this national fate of spain has been described so often that i will not attempt to write of it here the amphitheatre was immense and held at least four or five thousand persons who were seated upon the steps and were protected from the sun by a canvas awning similar to the velum of the roman amphitheatres the awning was kept constantly wet by a spray-like fine rain which did not go through the cloth thus although the performance began after the midday mass and lasted until sunset i do not recall having suffered a moment from the heat they killed ten bulls who were so beautiful and so well bred that they would have made the fortune of an american farmer the matador was the first of his kind at this epoch he was a handsome young man of twenty-five years in spite of the terrible danger which he ran on account of his remarkable agility you did not feel any anxiety certainly at the moment when the two adversaries alone face to face looked steadily at each other before the bull rushed upon the matador the most poignant emotion which could possibly be felt gripped all of the spectators you could have heard a pin drop but you must understand that the matador does not give the coup d'epée he only directs the point of the sword upon which the bull rushes to impale himself this spectacle was an epoch in my life and no other has left upon me so powerful an impression i have never forgotten the slightest detail and the recollection is as fresh in my memory after so many years as if i had seen it yesterday the day fixed for our departure we let the convoy set out and remained my husband and my son and myself to dine with mr langton a bark which had been prepared by his thoughtfulness was to take us to the other side of the bay to rejoin our caravan at port saint marie where we were to pass the night during this long journey we did not travel faster than a man can walk on foot I was feeling so ill that my husband hesitated to let me set out, and yet there was no means of drawing back. Our baggage had been sent forward. We had paid half of the cost of our trip as far as Madrid. Our passport had been visaed, and Monsieur de Roxant, a Republican consul, would have regarded any delay with suspicion. He would have attributed it to some pretext and as i have always believed that one can surmount any evil except perhaps a broken leg the thought never occurred to me to remain at cadiz we therefore dined with mr langton after having been present at the departure of our travelling companions who were to sleep at port saint marie nothing could be more delightful in point of neatness and care than this place of mr langton which was kept in the english fashion he had adopted none of the spanish practices except those customary to avoid the inconvenience of the very hot climate the house was built around a square court filled with flowers on the ground floor there was a line of arcades and an open gallery at the first floor an awning stretched at the height of the roof covered the whole surface of the court in the middle a jet of water reached the campus which being thus constantly wet communicated a delightful freshness to the whole house i admit that i experienced a very painful feeling in thinking that instead of remaining in this agreeable place it was necessary for me to begin a long journey in a heat of ninety-five degrees but the die was cast and it was necessary to depart after this farewell dinner towards evening we entered the bark and in an hour and a half the wind being favourable we arrived at port st marie there we found our caravan 
composed of fourteen carriages and six or seven hidalgos armed from head to foot. The aim of our second day's journey was Jerez, situated at a distance of only five leagues. As I had need of rest, we made up our minds once more to let the caravan go ahead and to rejoin it in the evening. We therefore took dinner at an early hour at Port Sainte Marie, a very pretty locality. Then we took a cabriolet, similar to those which I see here at Pisa, where I am writing these recollections. Our vehicle was attached to a large mule which had no bridle, which seemed to me curious. Upon the head of the mule was balanced a high plume to which bells were attached. A young boy with whip in hand sprang lightly upon the shafts, uttered some cabalistic words, and the mule set out at a trot as rapid as a good hunting gallop. The route was superb, and we went like the wind, the mule obeying docilely the voice of his little driver, avoiding obstacles and winding through the streets of the villages which we traversed with a wonderful sagacity. At first I was afraid, but reflecting that it was the custom of the country to drive this way, I became resigned. Arrived at Harris, I was curious to know the value of a mule like the one which had conducted us, and was told that it was worth from fifty to sixty louis, which seemed to me quite dear. The following day began our real travels. I was still indisposed, but stretched out as I was upon a good mattress, and the road being very fine, I did not suffer more than I would have if I had remained quiet. At two o'clock we stopped for dinner in some wretched inn, and it happened two or three times that we preferred to pass the night in our chariot rather than to sleep in bed so filthy as to be disgusting. It was night when we arrived at Cordoba. As we were travelling a certain distance behind, all the other members of the party had already found their lodgings when we reached the inn. As there were only beds to be had at the inn, it was necessary to look for a place to eat. We finally succeeded, with some difficulty on account of the advanced hour, in finding a kind of cabaret where we could only obtain some bread and a few slices of fried bacon. The following morning there was a delay in the departure of the convoy, which gave me an opportunity to see the magnificent cathedral of Cordova, of which so many descriptions have been written. You can readily believe that travelling in so uncomfortable a manner and also feeling quite ill in the heat which reigned in Andalusia from midday to three o'clock, the period of the day that we ordinarily stopped, I did not feel like visiting the monuments. This time we passed an hour in walking through the forest of columns of this cathedral. The muleteers came to urge us to set out. They were carrying sufficient provisions for two meals which we were to take in the open that day, as there was no dwelling in existence in the part of the country which we were going to traverse. On leaving Cordoba, we rode for a whole hour in the midst of groves of lemon trees and of Moorish olive trees, which were abundantly watered, before arriving at the wall of the ancient city, of which vestiges are still being uncovered. This will give an idea of the immense surface which was covered by this large Moorish city of other days, as in Italy you obtain an idea in the same way of the limits of ancient Rome. We had our dinner, as had been arranged, near a well in the midst of a pasture covered with sheep. The eye could not measure the extent of this plain, which was several leagues long, and covered in part with fine grass, and in part with dwarf myrtle trees. Several pomegranates covered with blossoms arose around the well. This halt had something oriental about it which singularly pleased me. I preferred it very much to the stops of three hours in the dirty inns, which were always so hot. The next day and the days following we crossed the Sierra Morena and saw two pretty little cities of La Colotta and La Carolina. These had been built by German colonists. 
and we observed that certain characteristics of the German physiognomy had not yet been entirely effaced. We encountered children with blonde hair, whose complexion, as dark as that of the Spaniards, was in marked contrast with their blue eyes. These little cities are picturesque and are constructed with regularity on fine sites. This route, which is very beautiful, is bordered on the hills by a parapet of marble. At the time, this was the only road between the south of Spain and Castile. To my great regret, we did not pass by Toledo. We arrived at Aranquez for dinner the 15th day of our journey, I think. Here we remained for the rest of the day. We admired the fresh shade, the handsome weeping willows and the green prairies. After having come from Andalusia, which was baked by the sun of July, it seemed to us like a green oasis in the middle of a desert. The river Tagus, although very small, is conducted with such art through this charming valley as to produce everywhere a delightful freshness. The court was not then at Aranquez. Nevertheless, for some reason which I have forgotten, we did not visit the chateau. The following day we reached Madrid, after a halt of two hours at Puerta del Sol while our baggage was being examined, ransacked and inspected. It would have been useless to show any impatience, for the sang-froid of the Castilians is not put out by anything. Finally, the signal for our departure was given, and they took us to the hotel, a mediocre inn located in a small street. Here we were assigned quite a good room. My husband immediately dispatched the letters and packages with which Mr. Langton had charged us for his wife and his two daughters. Then I made a more careful toilette than that of my chariot, with the intention of going to see these ladies after our dinner. But they called on us first. A half hour had hardly elapsed when we received a visit from two of the most beautiful ladies I have ever seen, Baron Dandier and Mademoiselle Carmen Langton. The mother, who was ill, had not been able to go out. Their brother-in-law, Monsieur Brown, accompanied them. His wife, who was dead, had been the third Mademoiselle Langton, who was said to have been more beautiful even than her sisters. These ladies showed us great kindness and attention, and their brother-in-law proposed that we should take a little furnished lodging in the quarter where these ladies lived. He took charge of all the necessary arrangements, and placed himself at our disposal for all the time that we remained at Madrid. Our sojourn could not be shorter than a month or six weeks at least, because we were awaiting replies from Bordeaux to the letters which we had written from Cadiz. However, on account of the delicate state of my health, I wished to be at Le Bouil before the 10th of November. My husband went the following day to see the ambassador of the directory to have his passport put in order. As he still preserved a very vivid recollection of the reception of the citizen, the former Comte du Marquis de Roxante, he was very agreeably surprised by the kind reception of the ambassador. He was the general, later the Maréchal Perignon. Formerly under the command of my father, he had received from him assistance which advanced his career. Not having forgotten this, he was full of politeness for my husband. Nevertheless, his gratitude did not go so far as to honour me with his visit. The seigneurs of other days were not yet in fashion, as they became later on. We remained six weeks at Madrid, during which time we were overwhelmed with the thoughtfulness, the attentions and the kindness of the Langton and Andile families. The son-in-law of Madame Langton, Monsieur Brown, whose wife had died the preceding year, conducted us to all the most interesting parts of the city, and every evening Madame Dondier took us to the Corso, then to take an ice in a fashionable café at the end of the Rue d'Alcala. Monsieur Brown showed us the portrait of his wife, she had been as beautiful, if not more beautiful, than her sisters, 
and he could not be consoled for her loss at the age of twenty-two years. End of part two, chapter five b. Part two, chapter six of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1796-1797. Visit to Paris. Finally, we received a letter from Bonnie stating the day that he would await us at Bayonne. And this time we engaged a little collieres to transport ourselves in our baggage. Monsieur de Lavaur, who had received word that his name had been erased from the list of emigres, proposed to accompany us, and we consented, although this was not at all agreeable to us. Monsieur de Chambeau was obliged to remain at Madrid. The tender friendship which he bore us, and of which he had given us many proofs, rendered this separation very painful for him and for us. For a period of three years he had shared all of our vicissitudes, our interests and our troubles. My husband considered him as a brother. During the long years of exile our thoughts had been the same. Thus our departure was a sad blow to our poor friend. He had no money, as no one had thought to send him any. We were happy to be in a position to leave him fifty louis and he was fortunate enough to be welcomed in the house of the Comtesse de Calves, where he remained until 1800. We left Madrid at two o'clock in the afternoon to spend the night at the Escurial. The Collieris was a fine old Berlin, drawn by seven mules, which were conducted, or rather counselled and exhorted, by a coachman seated upon the box and by an assistant postillion armed with a long whip. The latter sprang alternately from one to the other of the mules, who had no bridles, and obeyed only his voice. However, I think that the mules at the pole had reins, but the five others certainly not. One of them, the seventh, marched alone in front. She was named the Generale, and guided all the others. At a quarter of a league from Madrid, the coachman perceived that he had forgotten his mantle. In spite of the stifling heat, he was not willing to go another step before the postillion had gone back to look for it, mounted on one of the mules. This delayed us much, and we reached the Escurial only late in the evening. Nearly all of the following day was consecrated to a visit to this admirable monastery, of which so many descriptions have been written. Among all those which I have read since, none has seemed to me perfectly exact. They do not picture the kind of sad religious calm with which this place, this chef d'oeuvre of all the arts in the midst of a desert, imbues the soul. So many marvellous things seem to have been brought together in this solitude, only to recall to the mind the futility and the inutility of the works of man. Since then, when the events which have distracted Spain have been unrolled before me, I have been struck by the prophecy of the father who showed us the subterranean chapel in which are buried the kings of Spain since Philip the Second. After having walked through the midst of these tombs, all of which are similar, he called our attention to one which remained empty, that destined for the reigning King Charles the Fourth, and at the same time placing his hand on the sarcophagus, which was kept open by a wedge of marble, he said to us in Italian, Who knows whether he will ever occupy it? At the moment, this remark did not arrest my attention, but long afterwards, when I saw this unfortunate prince chased from his throne, this prophetic speech returned to my mind. Since the discovery of America and of the gold and silver mines of Peru, the kings of Spain have made every year to the church of the Escorial a magnificent present of these two medals. It thus happens that the treasury of the church has become the richest in all Europe. All of the articles provided by this luxurious custom arranged in order by years 
testified to an observing eye to the successive deterioration in taste from the first signed by Benvenuto Cellini to the last of very recent date. The top of the high altar, a bas-relief in solid silver, representing the apotheosis of Saint Laurent, patron of the Escurial, although of an unequal to magnificence, was not satisfactory as a work of art. I say was not, for there is reason to suppose that the misfortunes of Spain have led to the destruction of all these masterpieces. The different objects used for the religious worship were arranged in armoire à glass made of the finest wood of the East Indies. I have preserved a clear recollection of a sacred chiborium, Ciboire, in the form of a map of the world surmounted by a cross, the middle of which was ornamented by an enormous diamond, and the arms with four large pearls. There were also monstrances ostensoir, entirely covered with precious stones. They showed us the ornament du jour de Pâques, made of red velvet embroidered entirely with fine pearls, of different sizes according to the design. Many persons would not perhaps have appreciated this magnificence, for the smallest piece of stuff embossed with silver produced more effect. Nevertheless, there were many million pearls upon these plain pieces of velvet. We ascended to the rude loft, Jubé, where we saw some admirable books of the church formed of leaves of vellum, the margins of which were painted by the pupils of Raphael from his designs. These volumes, in grand in folio, ornamented with corners of silver, bound in a brown skin showing the reverse side, were placed in a kind of open case, separated from one another by slender pieces of wood. On account of their weight, it would have been difficult to take them out of their case. To obviate this inconvenience, there was arranged at the bottom of each of the cases little ivory wheels traversed by iron pins around which they turned. In this manner, the slightest effort was enough to draw one of these books to you. I have never seen this method employed in any other library. In this high gallery of the Escurial, we found the magnificent Christ in silver of life-size, made by Benvenuto Cennini. After having visited and admired this magnificent church, I was left alone, while my husband and Monsieur de Lavour went to visit the monastery and the library, where they saw the beautiful picture of Raphael named La Vierge à la Perle. I had not been informed at Madrid that a woman was not able to visit the library, which was situated in the interior of the monastery, without a special permit. I regretted this greatly. During the long time that I awaited my travelling companions, I had time for my mind to become lost in many meditations. I thought of the beauty of this edifice, then of the Battle of St. Quentin, lost by the French on the 10th of August, 1557, the fate day of Saint Laurent, in commemoration of which the Escorial was built by Philip II, the savage father of Don Carlos. So, when my husband returned and tapped me on the shoulder, saying, Let us go to see the house of the prince, I was almost vexed to have my thoughts disturbed. My son, being only a boy, had accompanied his father, and was very proud to be able to relate to me what he had seen. We then proceeded to this house of the prince, erected by Charles IV while he was prince of the Asturias, and where he retired when the court was at the Escurial to escape from the rigorous Spanish etiquette. It resembled a very elegant little house which a modest broker would hardly be contented with in our day, Pretty furniture, little tables, ornaments of doubtful taste, a quantity of draperies of the most shabby effect, gave it the appearance of a petit logis de fille. What a contrast with the admirable church which we had just left. 
it gave me a very disagreeable impression. Having returned to the inn, we at once set out to go to pass the night at La Granca, where the court was in residence at the Royal Chateau. Here we were to find dispatches from the American minister, Mr. Rutledge, for his consul at Bayonne. He invited us to supper, and the following day we set out for Zegovi, a very picturesque little city, with the chateau of which we saw only the court, surrounded by arcades in the Moorish style. The remainder of our journey was very uneventful. We remained a day at Victoria to care for the Generala, without whom we could not proceed. Then a day at Burgos, where I went to see the cathedral, and finally we arrived at San Sebastian, where Bonnie awaited us. I felt no pleasure in returning to France. On the contrary, the sufferings which I had endured during the last six months of my sojourn had left in my mind a sentiment of terror and horror which I could not overcome. I thought that my husband was coming back with his fortune lost and that difficult affairs would occupy him disagreeably and that we were condemned to live in a large, devastated chateau where everything had been sold at Le Buil. My mother-in-law was still living. She had again entered into possession of Tesson and Omleville. Without any intelligence, very suspicious, very obstinate, in business she had confidence in no one. How much I regretted my farm, my tranquillity. It was with a very heavy heart that I crossed the bridge of the Bedesoa and realised that I was upon the territory of the Republic, one and indivisible. We arrived at Bayonne in the evening. Hardly had we entered the inn when two members of the National Guard came to look for Monsieur de la Tour du Pin to take him before the authorities, represented then, it seems to me, by the President of the Department. This debut caused me great terror. Accompanied by Bonny, he was conducted before the assembled members of the tribunal. He was questioned as to his opinions, his plans, his actions, the causes and the reasons of his absence and those of his return. He had once perceived that he had been denounced by Monsieur de Roxant and declared so frankly, while stating at the same time how much, on the other hand, he had to praise in the attitude of the ambassador at Madrid. After a discussion which lasted at least two hours, my husband returned. They had authorised him to continue his route as far as Bordeaux, but armed with a kind of official itinerary in which the stops were indicated, and with the injunction to have this paper visaed at each place. Bonnie left us and returned to Bordeaux by the mail coach. We engaged a wretched driver who conducted us by short journeys. One event only marked our trip. At Mont de Masson, where I called a perruquier to dress my hair, he proposed to me, to my great surprise, to purchase my hair for two hundred francs. He said that blonde wigs were so much the fashion at Paris that he would certainly make a profit of at least a hundred francs if I would consent to sell him my hair. I refused this proposition, you may well believe, but I conceived a great respect for my hair, which was modesty apart, very handsome and very fine at that time. At Bordeaux we found again the excellent Brucon. He had prospered during the war against Spain and was now engaged in providing provisions for our armies in Italy. He received us with the tender friendship which had never for a moment changed. But I was impatient to be at home, and I made arrangements at once with my good Dr. Dupuy, who was to take care of me. Then the affair of raising the sequestration terminated, we went to Le Bouille to have the seals removed. The first moment, I admit, sorely tried my philosophy. I had left the house very well furnished, 
and if nothing very elegant was to be found there, at least everything was convenient and in sufficient quantity, I found it absolutely vacant. Not a chair to sit down on, not a table, not a bed. I was on the point of giving way to discouragement, but to complain would have been useless. At the farm, we set about unpacking our boxes, which had long since arrived at Bordeaux, and the sight of these simple little pieces of furniture transported to this vast chateau gave rise to many philosophical reflections. The next day many of the inhabitants of saint andre ashamed of having purchased our furniture at auction, came to propose to us to resell it for the price which it had cost them. Under these reasonable conditions, we again came into possession of those articles which we needed most. One of the things which had the most value was the equipment of our kitchen, which was very fine. It had been transported to a district of Bourg, with the intention of sending it to the Mint. This was resold to us, as well as the library, which had also been deposited in the district. We passed several days very agreeably in placing the books on the shelves, and before the arrival of Dr. Pouy, all of our interior arrangements had been finished, and we were as well installed as if we had been at Le Buil for a year. At this moment, I experienced a great pleasure. This was the arrival of my dear maid Marguerite. Madame de Valence, when she was released from prison at Paris, had engaged her to take care of her two daughters, but as soon as this excellent maid heard of my return, nothing could prevent her from coming to rejoin me. In spite of the aristocracy of her white apron, she had escaped from the dangers of the terror. She arrived at Le Buil in time to be present at the birth of my dear daughter Charlotte, who was born the 4th of November, 1796. I gave her the name of Charlotte because she was the goddaughter of Monsieur de Chambord. Nevertheless, upon the registry of the commune, she was inscribed under the name of Alex, which consequently was the only name she was able to use legally. When I was up again in the month of December, my husband started to make a circular trip to Tesson, Ombleville and La Roche Chalet, where there remained to us only some old ruined towers from the 20,000 francs of quit rent and rents which this land was worth. I remained alone in the large chateau of Le Buir with Marguerite, two servants, and old Biquet, who got drunk every night. The peasants in the farmyard were far away, only some wretched planks closed the part of the ground floor which was not yet finished. This was the time when troops of brigands called chauffeurs spread terror in all the southern part of France. Every day new horrors were recounted regarding them. I admit to my shame that I was cold with terror. It seems to me that I never in my life passed a time more painful. How much I regretted my farm my good negroes, and my tranquillity of other days. Our affairs, which were far from taking a favourable turn, also constantly preoccupied me. My husband had been advised not to accept the inheritance of his father except sur bénéfice d'inventaire, that is to say, in reserving the right to verify the charges or costs. Would to God that he had done so. But the sad manner in which we had lost my father-in-law, and the profound respect which my husband had for his memory, deterred him from adopting this course. This inheritance comprised the estate of Le Buil, several pieces of property in La Roche Chalet, and our rights to the fortune of my mother-in-law, which had formed part of our marriage contract. I will not enter into the details of our ruin, the recollection of which escapes me now, which, besides, I have never clearly understood. I only know that at the time of our marriage, my father-in-law was supposed to have an income of 80,000 francs. Without going into further details, it may be said that our loss in all 
amounted to nearly 60,000 francs of income. To this can be added the house at Saint, a fine dwelling in a perfect state of repair, and which could have been rented for 3,000 francs. The authorities of the department had occupied it, and when at the end of several years it was returned to us, it was in such a state of dilapidation that it had lost its entire value. We also lost the furniture of the Chateau of Tesson, which Monsieur de Montconseil had left to my father-in-law. This furniture was sold at the same time as that of Le Bouille, that is to say, during the months which elapsed between the epoch of the condemnation followed by the execution of my father-in-law and the date of the decree which restored the property of the persons condemned to their children. It can be said that it was during this period of several months that nearly all the furniture of the Chateau of France had been sold. It is necessary, however, to accept the libraries, which after having been transported to the chief places of the district, were subsequently restored to their owners. These sales struck the most disastrous blow to family souvenirs, and it is incontestable that the sudden dispersion of all these souvenirs of the paternal roof contributed strongly to the demoralisation of the young noblesse. We remained at Le Bouille the whole winter and a part of the spring. About the month of July, 1797, my husband recognised the necessity of going to Paris to terminate his arrangements with Monsieur de Lamette. As if inspired by presentiment, I requested to accompany him. Madame de Montesson, who was still full of kindness for me, arranged with Madame de Valence that I should live in her house at Paris. She herself was established for the summer in the country, in a house which she had just purchased near Saint-Denis. The six weeks which we expected to pass at Paris before returning to Le Wheel for the harvest of the grapes did not require any great quantity of baggage. We therefore transported only what was strictly necessary for us and our children. A large number of émigrés had returned under borrowed names. Madame de Nîmes, who had come back under the name of a milliner of Geneva, Mademoiselle Bautier, was situated with Madame de Poix at Saint-Ouen. Madame de Stahl, protected by Barris, the director, and many others were at Paris. Monsieur de Talleyrand had summoned us to come to Paris, and had particularly urged my husband to come there. People had commenced to speak of a counter-revolution, in which everybody believed. The government had been formed, and two assemblies, the Council of the Five Hundred and that of the Ancients, comprised many royalists. The Salon of Barra, the influential director, of which the Duchesse de Branca did the honours, was full of them, and although the other directors did not seem disposed to follow the example of their colleague, it is certain that never had the Bourbon cause had so much chance of success as at this epoch. We set out in a sort of little carriage, my husband, myself, my maid, Marguerite, and our two children, Humbert, seven and a half years of age, and Charlotte, who was only eight months old. We passed several days at Tesson, where we found the chateau in a terrible state of dilapidation. They had not only carried off the furniture, but had destroyed the papers, taken away the locks of many of the doors, the blinds of several windows, the irons of the kitchen, and the bars of the furnaces. It was a regular devastation. Fortunately, Gregoire had piled upon his bed and those of his wife and daughter, as many mattresses as he had been able to save, and these served as beds for us during our sojourn at Tesson. My emotion was vivid in finding again this good family of Grégoire, who had concealed my husband with so much care and devotion. Before this, in passing by Mirambeau, I had seen the locksmith Potier and his wife, with whom my husband had remained three months, shut up in a hole where there was not enough light to read by. How I again rendered thanks to God 
that he had permitted him to escape from all the frightful times of the terror. We finally arrived at the end of our journey. Madame de Valence received me with pleasure, and Madame de Montesson, who was not yet in the country, greeted me with a thousand acts of kindness. At Paris, any little thing out of the ordinary always attracts attention. Accordingly, I made a hit immediately on our arrival. As my husband and I were taking supper in the room of Madame de Valence, Monsieur de Talleyrand was announced. He was very glad to see us, and at the end of a moment he said, Eh bien, gouverneur, qu'est-ce que vous comptez faire? What? replied Monsieur de la Tour du Pain with surprise. Mais je viens pour arranger mes affaires. Ah, said Monsieur de Talleyrand, je croyais... Then he changed the conversation and spoke of indifferent matters. Several moments later, addressing Madame de Valence, he began to say, with that air of nonchalance which it is necessary to have seen to understand, à propos, vous savez que le ministère est changé? Les nouveaux ministres sont nommés. Ah, said she, et que sont-ils? Then, after a moment of hesitation, as if he had forgotten the names and was trying to recall them, he said, Ah oui, voici, un tel à la guerre, un tel à la marine, un tel aux finances, et aux affaires étrangères, said I. Ah, aux affaires étrangères? Eh, mais, moi, sans doute. Then, taking his hat, he went away. We looked at each other, my husband and myself, without surprise. For nothing could be surprising in the case of Monsieur de Talleyrand, except an act on his part of bad taste. He remained eminently the grand seigneur while serving a government composed of the refuse of the rabble. The next day found him established at the Office of Foreign Affairs as if he had occupied this post for the past ten years. The intervention of Madame de Stael, all powerful at this moment with Benjamin Constant, had made him minister. He had gone to her house and, throwing upon the table his purse, which contained only a few louis, had said, Voilà le reste de ma fortune. Demain, ministre, ou je me brûle la cervelle. None of these words were true, but it was dramatic, and Madame de Stael loved that. Besides, the nomination was not difficult to arrange. The directors, and above all Barra, were very much honoured to have such a minister. I will not relate here the history of the 18th Fructidor. You can read it in all the memoirs of the time. The royalists had a great deal of hope, and the different intrigues were mixed up in every sense of the word. Many of the émigrés had returned. They wore the rallying signs all of which were perfectly known to the police, the collar of the coat of black velvet, the knot, in I know not what form, in the corner of the handkerchief, and so on. It was by absurdities of this kind that they thought to save France. Madame de Montesson returned from the country expressly to give a dinner to the deputies who were well disposed. Monsieur de Bouchon, our excellent friend, was also one of the hosts of these dinners, where they talked with an unbelievable imprudence. We met again every day, my husband and I, some people of our acquaintance, and the originality of the life which I had led in America, and the desire which I evinced of returning there, rendered me for a month very much in vogue. Madame Denis, our aunt, had returned, as I have already said, under a borrowed name with the Geneva passport, She was living with Madame de Poix, who herself was installed for the duration of the summer in a house which she had borrowed at Saint-Ouen. We went there to pass several days, to the great pleasure of Humbert, who was very much bored at Paris, for he was not able to go out. I also saw Madame de Stael nearly every day. In spite of her liaison, more than intimate, with Benjamin Constant, She was working for the Royalist Party. 
You may well believe that my first care on arriving at Paris was to go to see Madame Tallien, to whom we owed our life. I found her established in a little house called La Chaumière at the end of the Cour la Reine. She received me with much affection and wished immediately to explain how it happened that she had found herself under the necessity of marrying Tallien, by whom she had a child. Her family life with this new husband already seemed insupportable. Nothing could equal, it seemed, his distrustful and suspicious character. She related to me that one night, when she had returned at one o'clock in the morning, he had such an attack of jealousy that he had been on the point of killing her. Seeing him armed with a pistol, she had taken flight and had gone to demand asylum and protection from Monsieur Martel, whose life she had saved at Bordeaux, but he had refused to receive her. She wept bitterly in recounting to me this act of ingratitude. Therefore my gratitude, which I expressed with warmth, as indeed I felt it, seemed very sweet to her. Tallien came for a moment to his wife's room. I thanked him quite coldly, and he told me to count on him under all circumstances. You will see later on in what way and in what manner he kept his word. End of part two, chapter six. Part two, chapter seven a of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1797 to 1798, Exile in England. My husband was busy with his affairs and had undertaken negotiations to repurchase a part of the estate of Hautefontaine, which had been sold when one morning at daybreak the 18th Fructidor, the 4th of September, 1797, I thought I heard upon the boulevard a noise of artillery carriages. As my room looked out on the court, I told Marguerite to go to the window of the Salle à Manger to see what was going on. On her return, she told me that the boulevard was filled with a number of generals, with troops and cannon. I arose as soon as possible, and sent to awaken my husband who was sleeping in the room above mine. We both went to the window where a short time later we were joined by Madame de Valence. Augereau was there, giving orders. The Rue de Capucine and the Rue Neuve du Luxembourg were barricaded. Towards midday, as nobody had brought us any news, Madame de Valence and I, inspired by curiosity, went out, quietly dressed, in order not to be remarked, with the intention of going to see Madame de Stal. As the streets above mentioned were barricaded by pieces of cannon, and the Rue de la Paix was not in existence at that period, we were obliged to ascend as far as the Rue de Richelieu to find a free passage. All the shops were closed. There were a good many people out, but no one was talking. Finally, we arrived at the residence of Madame de Stael. She was with Benjamin Constant, and very much incensed with him, because he maintained that the directory in arresting the deputies had only performed an indispensable coup d'etat. From Monsieur Constant we learned that all of the émigrés who had returned had received an order once more to leave France, under pain of being judged by military commissions. This news filled me with consternation, and I hastened to return home to inform my husband. On arriving, I found my husband very much perplexed as to the means of notifying my aunt of these events. She was living at saint Ouen, and the gates of Paris were closed. No one was able to pass the barriers without a special permission. By a singular piece of good fortune, I met Madame de Pontecoulon, whom I knew, as I had often seen her with Madame de Valence. I will tell later on who she was. 
As she had a permit of the section for herself and her maid, she was able to go to Saint-Denis, where her country house was located. I begged her to let me take the place of the maid, and with her usual kindness she consented. You can easily imagine with what exclamations I was received by Madame de Poix and my aunt. The latter decided to leave at once for England. With these ladies were several former émigrés who were in despair of the necessity of once more leaving France. By the terms of the decree, all the émigrés who had returned upon French territory were ordered to leave Paris within twenty-four hours and France within a week. My idea was to return at once to Le Bouille. Having left France with a proper passport, and having returned with this same passport, duly visaed by the French authorities in the United States and in Spain, I thought that the decree could not apply to us, as we had not returned secretly. To assure himself on this point, my husband went to find Monsieur de Talleyrand. The latter, very much occupied with his own future, was not giving much thought to that of others, he at once replied without hesitation that it was not his affair, and told us to submit the case to Sautin, the Minister of Police. I accordingly went to see Talien, who received me very cordially. He promised to go at once to see Sautin, to have him annotate the paper without which we could not have visaed the passport of the municipality of Saint-André de Cubzac with which we had come to Paris, and which you must have in our possession in order to pass the barriers. I came home quite disturbed, and commenced to pack my trunks. A police decree had just been posted, ordering all proprietors to send in a report as to the persons living in the houses who were at Paris without papers in regular order. We were unwilling to cause any trouble to Madame de Montesson, with whom we were lodging. Finally, after a trying delay of several hours, Talien sent me back the request which he had submitted to the inspection of Sautin. The minister had added with his own hand and signed the following annotation. This private individual is within the law. Talien in the note which he wrote me at the same time, in the third person, excused himself politely for not having been able to obtain anything. But the end of his note could be translated by the words, I wish you a bon voyage. There were two alternatives from which to choose. We could ask for a passport for Spain and proceed to Le Bouille, where I could remain some time while my husband went to St. Sebastien. This would have been the wisest course. We could also go to England, and from there, according to circumstances, return to America. My aunt, Madame Denine, had much influence with my husband, and she induced him to adopt the latter course. We had very little money, but were assured of finding at London my stepmother, Madame Dillon, and many other very close relations who without doubt would be disposed to come to our aid. We therefore decided to leave for England. Having come to Paris with the intention of remaining only five or six weeks, we had brought with us only the most necessary baggage. I had, in addition, several dresses which I had had made at Paris, Two very small trunks contained all of our baggage, including that of my maid Marguerite, who had decided this time not to leave us. This departure was destined to have the most unfortunate consequences for us. We were in negotiations with the new owners of Hautefontaine to repurchase the property, but this new emigration put an end to all of our arrangements. The two or three days which preceded our departure were passed in a state of sadness and disquietude. Perhaps it would have been better for us to have returned at a wheel. 
the report was current that Barras, who had yielded for the moment to the demands of his colleagues, would soon regain his authority and at the same time resume his favourable disposition regarding the émigrés. Everywhere you met people who were in despair over this new immigration. We reserved three places in a carriage which was to take us in three days to Calais. Two other places were occupied by Monsieur de Beauvau and by a cousin of Madame de Valence, the young César Ducrest, an amiable young man who was destined to perish so miserably several years later. The French are naturally light-hearted, so in spite of the fact that we were all in despair, ruined, furious, we found nevertheless the means of being in good humour and of laughing. Monsieur de Beauvau, our cousin, was going to rejoin his wife, who had been a Mademoiselle de Mortemar, and his three or four children. She was living in a country house at Staines, near Windsor, with her grandfather, the Duc d'Arcourt, formerly governor of the first Dauphin, who died at Meudon in 1789. Madame de Beauvau was the youngest of the three granddaughters of the Duc d'Arcourt. Their mother had married the Duc de Mautemar and had died long before the Revolution. Monsieur de Mautemar had then married a Mademoiselle de Prisac, the mother of the present Duke. We appeared before all the municipalities, in the localities situated on the route, including those of Calais, where we embarked on the packet one evening at eleven o'clock. I was seated upon the deck, holding my daughter in my arms, while Marguerite was occupied in putting my son to bed, and my husband was suffering as usual from seasickness, although there was little wind and the night was superb. Beside me was a gentleman who, seeing me embarrassed with my child, proposed to me with an English accent that I should lean against him. And as I turned to thank him, he saw my face in the moonlight and cried, Bon Dieu, est-ce que possible? It was young Jeffreys, son of the editor of the Edinburgh Review. I had seen him every day at Boston at his uncle's at the time of our sojourn in this hospitable city three years before. We talked much of America and of the regret which I had felt in leaving it. I gave him to understand that in spite of the presence of all my family in England, I was going there inspired only by the desire and the plan of returning to my farm, if all hope of a return to France vanished or at least became indefinite. The night passed in talking of England with my companion, and the first rays of the sun revealed to us the white cliffs of England, to which a strong southeast wind had brought us near. We landed to find ourselves handed over to the brutality of the English customs officers, who seemed to me worse even than those of Spain. At the sight of my passport, which I presented at the alien office, I was asked if I was a subject of the King of England, and upon my affirmative reply they told me that I should give as reference some person who was known in England. Having named without hesitation my three uncles, Lord Dillon, Lord Kenmare, and Sir William Jerningham, the tone and manner of these employés changed very quickly. These details took up the morning. After an English luncheon, or rather dinner, we left Dover for London. We spent the night at Canterbury or at Rochester. My recollections are not very precise as to the locality. And the following morning we arrived at London and went to one of the inns in Piccadilly. As I had written my aunt, Lady Jerningham, from Dover to announce our arrival, she had sent her son Edward to bring us to her house in Bolton Row. Her reception was entirely maternal. She immediately informed us of her departure for her country place at Cossey, where she said she expected to stay at least six months. She invited us to come and pass this time with her. 
my good aunt was particularly amiable towards my husband, and being very fond of children, she conceived at once a great affection for Humbert. We therefore took up our residence in Bolton Row like children of the family. Here I found again my excellent old friend, the Chevalier Jerningham, brother of Sir William, the husband of my aunt. The faithful friendship which he had shown me since my childhood was as sweet as it was useful during my sojourn in England. I was arranging to go to see my stepmother, Madame Dillon, who had been living in England for two years, when she came to see my aunt. My arrival in London was an event in the family. Here I met again Betsy de la Touche, the daughter of my stepmother. She had been confided to my care in 1789 and 1790, when she was at the convent of the Assumption, where I often went to see her, and whence I alone had permission to take her out from time to time. She had married Edward de Fitzjames. She was a very sweet and amiable young woman, worthy of all good fortune. She was passionately fond of her husband, who did not return her affection, and his cruel and public infidelities had broken her heart. Alexandre de la Touche, her brother, was three years younger than herself. He was a handsome young man, light-headed, gay, but with little mind and still less education. He had all the whims of the young émigrés who had nothing to do, was destitute of any talent, loved horses, society and small intrigues, but never opened a book. My stepmother, who as long as I knew her, never had a book on the table, could not have given him any taste for reading. She herself was not lacking in natural intelligence, and had good manners and was well-bred. Nevertheless, I have often asked myself why my father, who was endowed with a superior mind, and was a man of fine education, had married a woman older than himself. It is true that she was rich, but nevertheless, she could not pass for being what was called an heiress. Although he desired a son above all things, they had only three daughters. Two died as small children, and only the eldest, Fanny, survived. My uncle, the Archbishop, and my grandmother were living in London. I had not seen them since my departure from their house in 1788. My aunt, Lady Jerningham, thought that I would do well to pay them my respects and the good Chevalier, her brother-in-law, undertook to ask them if they would consent to receive me. My grandmother, seeing that the Archbishop decided, dared not offer any opposition. At the same time, she made a condition that my husband should not accompany me. I could have made this condition a pretext for not going to see them, but I feigned ignorance. My husband, besides, was very happy to be relieved of this visit, for even at this time, he confessed to me later, he knew that my grandmother had spoken very unkindly of him since she had been in London. If I had known this at the time, I should certainly have refrained from going to see her. One morning, therefore, I turned my steps towards Thayer Street with my little Umbert, it was not without an emotion mingled with many different feelings that I knocked at the door of this modest mansion inhabited by my uncle and my grandmother. The house seemed to me to take the place without transition of the fine hotel of the Faubourg Saint-Germain where I had passed my childhood, surrounded by the luxury and the splendour which can be obtained in life with an income of 400,000 francs, which the Archbishop of Narbonne enjoyed at that time. An old domestic opened the door for me. On seeing me, he burst into tears. He was one of the servants of Haute Fontaine, where he had been present at my marriage. He preceded me, and I heard him announce me in a voice full of emotion, saying, 
Here is Madame de Gouvernet. My grandmother arose and came to meet me. I kissed her hand. Her reception was very cold, and she called me Madame. At the same moment the Archbishop entered, and throwing his arms around my neck, he kissed me tenderly, and then, seeing my son, he embraced him several times. He addressed several questions in English and in French to the boy, who replied with an intelligence which charmed my uncle. My uncle invited me to come to dinner the following day with six old bishops from Languedoc, whom he had taken en pension at his table. They were all former acquaintances of mine. As for my husband, he was not mentioned. I announced my plan to go and visit my aunt at Cossy during the period of her sojourn there. The Archbishop expressed his satisfaction, but my grandmother was certainly much put out. End of Part 2, Chapter 7a Part 2, Chapter 7b of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Lady Jerningham, who had been very anxious as to the result of my visit, was happy that everything had gone so well. The following day my aunt took me to see two other uncles. One was Lord Dillon, elder brother of my father. He lived in a handsome mansion in Portman Square with his second wife, two of her daughters, and a young son, eight or nine years of age, who was a beautiful boy. Lady Dillon had been a Mademoiselle Rogier of Belgian origin. She had all the appearance of what she was in reality, a former actress. She had been the mistress of my uncle before his marriage to Miss Phipps, daughter of Lord Mulgrave. From this liaison had been born a son who according to the custom allowed in England among the Protestants, had been authorised to bear the name of his father. As I have already stated at the commencement of these recollections, Lord Dillon, at the time he bore only the title of the Honourable Charles Dillon, was a gambler and a spendthrift, and was loaded with debt. He abjured the religion of his fathers to become a Protestant at the instigation of his grand-uncle Robert Lee, fourth and last Earl of Lichfield, who had demanded this as the price of his inheritance, an income of £15,000 sterling and the beautiful castle of Ditchley. Assured of this handsome fortune and wishing to have an heir, he married a Protestant, Miss Phipps, and made her so unhappy that she died at the age of twenty-five years, leaving him a son, Henry Augustus, who later became Viscount Dillon, and a daughter who married Sir Thomas Webb. My uncle then lived openly with Mademoiselle Rogier, by whom he had had two daughters during the life of his wife. After his wife's death, he publicly married her, his sister, Lady Jerningham, was extremely dissatisfied, and to appease her, he confided to her his legitimate daughter to bring up, and only kept with him the two bastards. These used his name, with this difference, that they did not put upon their visiting cards, Honourable Miss Dillon, but Miss Dillon only. They were both charming girls, pretty and well brought up. One died at the age of eighteen, and the other married Lord Frederick Beauclerc, brother of the Duke of St. Albans. As my aunt was not particularly anxious to see Lady Dillon, I went to her house with her daughter, Lady Beddingfeld, my cousin, who was at that time in London for several days. Lord Dillon received us very politely, but as a man of the world, without showing the least interest. He offered us his box for the opera for the same evening, and we accepted. This was the only benefit that I received from him. He gave a pension of a thousand pounds sterling to his uncle, the Archbishop, who was eighty years of age. 
as far as I was concerned, although I was the daughter of his brother, he never came to my aid during the two and a half years I passed in England. The second uncle whom I visited, this time with Lady Jerningham, was Lord Kenmare, who had formerly borne the name of Valentine Brown. He received me in a very different manner, although I was his niece only by his first wife, a sister of my father, who had been dead for many years. He was then remarried. By his first wife he had a daughter, Lady Charlotte Brown, who was accordingly my cousin. She later became by marriage Lady Charlotte Gould. Lord Kenmare, his daughter and all his family, received me with the greatest kindness and goodness, and the friendship of Lady Charlotte in particular has never become cold. She was then eighteen years of age, and had many aspirants for her hand, as she had a fortune of twenty thousand pounds sterling. I went to see my aunt, Madame Denine, at Richmond. She was much displeased with our plan of passing some time at Cossey with Lady Jerningham. Madame Denine was exceedingly domineering, even to the point of tyranny, and everything which brought the slightest umbrage to her empire put her out to a most unreasonable degree. Her authority was exercised principally upon Monsieur de Lally, although it must be admitted that she was very useful to him through the firmness and decision of her character. But she did not suffer any rival, and Monsieur de Lally had committed the imprudence during the two or three months that Madame Denin had passed in France of going to Cossy, where he had enjoyed himself like a schoolboy on his vacation. Madame Denin had accordingly conceived a great aversion for Lady Jerningham. Accordingly, on learning that her nephew, Monsieur La Tour du Pain, and I had formed the project of passing six months in the country with Lady Jerningham, she had a feeling of vexation which she did not try to dissimulate. In spite of her character, Madame Denis nevertheless did not like a spirit of justice. She was forced to admit that, having arrived in England without resources, it was very natural for us to accept with pleasure an invitation from a relative so near and so highly considered in the world as my aunt Jerningham. Madame Denis and Monsieur de Lally had an establishment in common. The age of the two should have prevented the public from finding any scandalous motive in this association. Nevertheless, people turned the matter into ridicule. Madame Denis, in spite of her real and great qualities, was not generally liked. After a residence of three days at London, I realised that I would not have any pleasure in staying there longer. The society of the émigrés, their gossip, their little intrigues and slander had rendered my sojourn disagreeable. Finally, to my great joy, the time came for our departure for Cossy. Lady Jerningham had preceded us to the country. It was therefore arranged that I should stay with my stepmother, Madame Dillon, for several days. There I learned with great satisfaction that Edward de Fitzjames had some saddle horses. As I had the reputation of being an excellent horsewoman, he procured for me a side saddle. My stepmother gave me a fine equestrian habit, and every day we took long rides. We set out from London like a caravan. My stepmother, myself, my daughter, my son, my maid Marguerite, and Flora, the coloured maid of Madame Dillon, in one Berlin, Madame de Fitzjames, Alexandre de la Touche, and my husband, in another. Then followed the aged governess of Betsy, and finally, Monsieur de Fitzjames, his horses, grooms, and so on. We stopped for the night at Newmarket, where I held the famous horse races, which I was very curious to see. We remained here all the next day. It was the last day of the races, and one on which was run the Royal Cup. We passed the whole day upon the turf, and by good chance, quite rare in England, the weather was very fine. 
I have guarded the memory of this day as one of those in my life when I was the most amused and interested. The following day we set out to arrive for the night at Cossi. It was, I think, during the first days of October, 1797. My aunt, who was very fond of children, took possession of Umbert. Every morning after breakfast she took him to her room and kept him all the morning, occupied in giving him lessons and making him read and write in English and in French. His toilette also was the object of her care. She furnished him with suits, overcoats, linen, and a complete child's wardrobe. She was also extremely kind to me. Having observed that I was able to make my dresses myself, under the pretext of inspiring in Fanny Dillon a love of work, she brought to my room and placed at my disposal pieces of muslin and material of every kind, an attention which was all the more agreeable as I had arrived from France very lightly dressed for the climate of England. My aunt had learned that my children had not been inoculated, vaccination having then only recently been discovered, and she took charge of supplying this omission and had her own surgeon come from Norwich to perform the operation. In fine, she surrounded us with care of every kind, and the time which I passed at Cossey was as agreeable as we could possibly have wished. Sir William possessed an income estimated at £18,000 sterling, which does not constitute a large fortune in England, but was sufficient to enable him to live handsomely. His house was old, but convenient. The chapel in which the chaplain officiated was installed in the garret, following the usage of the Catholics prior to the emancipation. The winter passed very agreeably. Towards the month of March, Madame Dillon, my sister Fanny and Monsieur and Madame de Fitz James returned to London, but we remained at Cossy until the month of May. As my aunt was to pass the summer at London, Sir William proposed to us to take possession, during the period of his absence, of a pretty cottage which he had built in the park. I preferred, however, not to remain there alone, and furthermore, Madame Denin was very much enraged at the idea of the prolongation of our sojourn in the country, and insisted on having us with her at Richmond, where she could give us lodging. We therefore agreed to go there and rejoin her, although it was much against my desire but my husband did not wish to disoblige his aunt, and besides this we had some business in London about which I am going to speak. As I have not re-read the first part of these recollections, I am not certain that I stated that at the time of my arrival at Boston I had written my excellent instructor, Monsieur Combe, who was then living with my stepmother at Martinique. My father had given him a good position, that of recorder of the island. He had exercised this function at St. Christophe and Tobago, and living in the house, he had been able to accumulate his salary until it amounted to the sum of 60,000 francs. Madame Dillon had borrowed this capital from him, agreeing to pay him interest. When Monsieur Combe learned at Martinique of our arrival at Boston, and also of our intention to buy property, the excellent man who loved me like a father had the thought of joining this sum, his entire fortune, to the funds which we possessed, in order to permit us to acquire a more considerable establishment where he would come to be with us and pass the rest of his days. He therefore asked Madame Dillon to repay the capital which he had loaned her. She not only refused his demand, but she also would not set the time when she would repay his money. He was in despair over the failure of his plans, and prayed and menaced Madame Dillon, but all without effect. Every vessel which came from Martinique to the United States brought me a letter from him. He wrote that 
he did not dare to leave Madame Dillon, hoping that by his presence he would finally succeed in obtaining his money. In the midst of all this, Madame Dillon left for England. Before her departure, poor Monsieur Combe, who remained at Martinique, succeeded in obtaining a paper in due form acknowledging the debt of 60,000 francs of capital and the interest which then amounted to nearly 10,000 francs in addition. Upon my arrival at Richmond, I received the sad news of the death of my old friend. A short time before, in his last letter, he told me that the climate of the islands, and still more the chagrin at knowing that I was once again in France without resources, was killing him. He added that he was writing to Madame Dillon requesting her to pay me the interest of the capital of 70,000 francs which she owed him. By will, in legal form, he left me his credit of 70,000 francs on Madame Dillon, as well as the running income, which amounted to 15 or 18,000 francs. From the very day that she knew of this legacy, the attitude of Madame Dillon towards us completely changed. She kept a fine house at London and spent freely in dinners and evening entertainments, but if we had need of money, she referred us to a Creole émigré who was charged with the care of her affairs. To all our demands with the object of having her fix a date, when she would pay the interest of our credit, she replied evasively. One time there was no sale for her sugar. Another time her funds had not been received. In short, every day some new excuse was offered. Having addressed myself directly to her, I was very badly received. We spoke of the matter to her son, Alexandre de la Touche. My husband also took the matter up with her man of affairs. But all of our attempts remained without success. The money which we received was given us like arms, though it came from our own property. Nevertheless, it was necessary for us to pay our part of the expenses with Madame Denin, and this constituted for us a new cause of embarrassment. How many times I regretted that I had not remained at Cossy. Our participation in the household of Madame Denin was to me insupportable. She had given us such bad quarters that we were not able to receive anyone. Our lodging comprised only two small bedrooms on the ground floor. And in England it is not customary to receive visitors in your bedrooms. I occupied one of these rooms with my daughter, and my husband the other with our son. In the evening only we found our aunt in a handsome salon which she had on the first floor. It was very inconvenient, certainly, but if our life had been pleasant... I would not have been disturbed. While admitting the great and fine qualities of Madame Denine, and never failing to show her the respect which I owed her, I was forced nevertheless to recognise that our characters were not sympathetic. Perhaps it was my fault, and I should have remained insensible to the thousand pinpricks which she gave me. Monsieur de Lally, the most timid of men, would not have dared to venture the least drollery which might have amused me. I was still young and gay. At twenty-eight years of age, how could I have the severity of mien imposed by the fifty years of my aunt? Absorbed in politics, the only thing which interested her was the constitution which it was necessary to give to France. This bored me to death. And then came the writings of Monsieur Lally, which it was necessary to read and re-read, word by word, phrase by phrase. In fine, I aspired to have a household of my own, no matter how small it might be. As I could not see any opportunity, I was resigned. End of Part 2, Chapter 7b
Part 2, Chapter 8 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1798 to 1799, Life at Richmond. It was at the beginning of the summer of 1798 that the Princesse de Bouillon, of whom I've spoken at the commencement of these recollections, came to England to arrange the affairs of an inheritance which had been left her by her friend, the Duchesse de Biron. If I'm not mistaken, the sum involved was 600,000 francs in English funds. Madame de Bouillon was a German Princesse de Hesse Rottenburg, although she had passed her life in France, where she married the cripple who had never been her husband except in name. Joined by a long and faithful attachment to Prince Emmanuel de Zahm, she had had a daughter who was brought up under the name of Theresia. During the emigration, this daughter had married a young councillor of the Parliament of Aix, who has since become well known, Monsieur de Vitrol. One morning, after my aunt had gone to make a call on Madame de Bouillon, I saw these two ladies return together. Several moments later, Madame Denine entered my room, accompanied by my husband. We have arranged for you, she said. Monsieur de Vitrol is going away, and Madame de Bouillon does not wish to remain alone in her lodging, although she has it at her disposal for three months still. She wishes to give it up to you in exchange for your own. You'll be much more comfortable there. A sign from my husband gave me to understand that I ought to accept this proposition. I therefore moved to the dwelling of Madame de Bouillon, and here was born a boy to whom we gave the name of Edward, as he was the godson of Lady Jerningham and her son Edward. The good Chevalier Jerningham came to see me and said that my aunt, his sister-in-law, thought that with three children I could not, when I left my present residence, return to the two little rooms of the modest lodging which I had occupied with Madame Denine. He had therefore undertaken to find a small house at Richmond where we would be at home. His search had succeeded beyond anything we could have hoped for. The house belonged to a former actress of Drury Lane, who had been at one time very beautiful and very popular. She never occupied it, but the dwelling was so neat and well kept that she was not anxious to lease it. However, the eloquence of the Chevalier and the forty-five pounds sterling offered as rent by Lady Jerningham decided her. This little house, which was a real jewel, was only fifteen feet wide. On the ground floor was a hall, a pretty salon with two windows, and then a stairway which was hardly visible. The first floor comprised two charming bedrooms, and the floor above two other rooms for servants. At the end of the hall on the ground floor was a nice kitchen, which looked out on a miniature garden, with only a path and two flower beds. There were rugs everywhere, and a fine English oilcloth in the passageways and upon the staircase. Nothing could have been more attractive, cleaner, and more gracefully furnished than this little house, which could have all been put in a room of medium size. However, I was very unhappy in taking possession, for that very day I lost my little boy, aged three months. He was carried off in a moment by an attack of pleurisy, which I attributed to the neglect of the English maid who cared for him. I was very ill and almost dying when I took possession of the little house with my two surviving children, Humbert and Charlotte. Having only these two children to look after, we discharged our English servant. My maid Marguerite, had learned a little cooking during my absence in the United States, and she very willingly placed her experience, and above all, her zeal, at our disposal. England, whether of fortunes so immense, 
existence is so luxurious is at the same time the country and the world where poor people can live in the most comfortable manner. For instance, there is no necessity for going to market. The butcher never fails a single day to come at a fixed hour crying, Butcher, at your door. You open the door and tell him what you want. Is it a leg of lamb? He brings it all arranged, ready to put upon the spit. Is it lamb chops? They are arranged on a little wooden platter which he calls for the following day. On a slip of paper are written the weight and the price. About this time, as Madame Dillon refused to pay our income, we found ourselves much embarrassed. All the money which we had on hand was five or six hundred francs, and when this sum was spent, we did not know what we could do, not for a lodging, for our little house cost us nothing, but literally for food. My friend Chevalier Jerningham had informed me that my uncle Lord Dillon had refused with the greatest severity to come to our aid. In addition to this, all communications had ceased with France. At this moment, we received from Monsieur de Chambeau, who was still living in Spain, a despondent letter in which he said that he had no news from France and that nobody had sent him a sou. His uncle, the former fermier general of whom he was the sole heir, had just died, after having made a will in his favour, but the government had confiscated the inheritance on the ground that he was an émigré. The day that he wrote us, a last Louis composed his entire fortune, and he could no longer count upon his friends in Spain, whose goodwill he had already exhausted. Upon receiving this letter, my husband did not hesitate a moment to share with his friend the last of his funds. He rushed to a banker where he purchased a draft for ten pounds sterling, payable to bearer. The same day, he sent it to Madrid. This was nearly a half of our own resources. There remained with us only twelve pounds sterling on hand, without any other resources to pay our bills when this sum was spent. We were not willing to ask the aid afforded by the English government to the emigres on account of my family and above all, on account of Lady Jerningham. So far as Lord Dillon was concerned, I had no scruples of any kind. Out of respect for the memory of my father, I did not wish to declare publicly that his widow, Madame Dillon, my stepmother, who was proprietor of a house at London, where she gave dinners and evening entertainments, had refused to come to my succour. A last five-pound note was all we had left when one morning, my good cousin, Edward Jerningham, came to see me. He was a charming young man who had just passed his twenty-first birthday. He well justified the passionate love which his mother felt for him. As he arose to leave, I went to the door to see him mount his horse. He remained a moment behind, and I saw him slip something into my work basket. I made a pretense of not noticing anything on account of his extreme embarrassment. After his departure, I found in my basket a sealed letter addressed to me. It contained only these words. Offered to my dear cousin by her friend Ned, and a note for one hundred pounds sterling. My husband returned a moment afterwards, and I said to him, See? Here is the reward for what you have done for Monsieur de Chambeau. The next day, as you may well suppose, he went to London to thank Edward, but found that he had already left for Cossy. Several days later, I also went to London with two English ladies whom I knew and whom I frequently saw at Richmond. They were two sisters, of whom the elder, Miss Lydia White, has been celebrated as a famous blue stocking, she had conceived for me a kind of romantic passion on account of my adventures in America. One of these ladies sang well, and we enjoyed our music together. Their books were at my disposal. When I went to visit them in the morning, they kept me with them the whole day, and when the evening arrived, I was only able to tear myself away by promising to return before the end of the week. 
Having formed the plan of passing a week at London, they implored Monsieur de la Tour du Pain to permit me to accompany them. This little trip to London with Miss Lydia White and her sister put me somewhat in touch with society. We went to the opera, and they also took me to a large assembly at the house of a lady whom I hardly saw. There were people on the stairway, and no one was able to sit down. We had great difficulty in leaving the house, the crowd of guests were so numerous. At the end of the week, which appeared to me long and tiresome, I returned with pleasure to Richmond. Monsieur de Poix, who was living at Richmond, had an excellent horse and a tilbury. Frequently I went on foot to Teddington, a village about two miles from Richmond, and he brought me back to Richmond in his carriage. In this way passed the summer of 1798. We made an excursion of a week of which I retain the pleasantest recollections. My children were so safe with my excellent maid that this little absence did not cause me any disquietude. We set out, Monsieur de Poire and I in his Tilbury, my husband on horseback, and having passed Windsor, we went to spend the night at Maidenhead. From there we went to Oxford, to Blenheim, to Stowe, and returned by Aylesbury and Uxbridge. The beautiful country estates which we visited charmed me. It is in the country only that the English are really grands seigneurs. We were favoured by very fine weather during the whole week which we employed for this excursion. In this connection, I must say that the climate of England outside of London is very much calumniated. I have not found it worse than that of Holland, and incomparably better and less uncertain than that of Belgium. A little trip left me with the most agreeable impression. Returned to Richmond, I resumed my household occupations. The news from France appeared somewhat better. My husband even formed the plan of sending me over for several days, armed with an English passport, which would not have been entirely false, since I should have signed it by my maiden name, Lucy Dillon. At this moment, unfavourable news was received, and this determined me to renounce my trip to France. The news came the very day that I was to set out. Personally, I was much pleased not to undertake this trip, which was very disagreeable to me, not because I was afraid, but because the thought of leaving my husband and children caused me a real chagrin. At this time, I made the resolution never to return to France without them. My life at Richmond was very monotonous. I no longer saw anything of Madame Dillon, since we had succeeded in getting some money from her, at the end of a very lively correspondence between my husband and her man of affairs. When I went to London, which happened only once or twice, I saw no one except Lady Jerningham or Lord Kenmare, who for a year past had given me six louis a month. Once I paid a visit to Madame de Dura at Teddington, where I went sometimes alone on foot, and sometimes with Monsieur de Poix in his carriage. Towards the end of the winter, Miss White left Richmond. This was a real grief to me, not because we had formed a durable friendship, but because she had been so kind to me that I found her sojourn in our neighbourhood very agreeable. For some time past, my health had not been good. I felt very languid, without knowing exactly what was the matter with me, I was not able to have a carriage, and our house was situated in a remote quarter called The Green. I had therefore given up going out after supper, and devoted my evenings to reading the books which Miss White, who had a fine library, had sent me in large numbers. A subscription to the circulating library is very dear in England, and I was not able to take one. Therefore, you can imagine my joy when one day... I received a box addressed in my name, of which the messenger gave me the key. I opened it and found 
ten volumes from Ookham's Circulating Library at London, with a catalogue of 20,000 volumes of all kinds, English and French, which were contained in this library. Joined to this consignment was a receipt, in my name, for a year's subscription, with a notice that by putting the box on the stage at seven o'clock in the morning, I would receive the same evening the new books which I had ordered. Nothing could have been more agreeable to me than this attention. I attributed it to Miss White. Having written to thank her, she made no reply, from which I inferred that she did not wish to admit that she had sent the books. The summer of 1799, my health was somewhat better. Our house on the green had a party wall with that of a rich alderman of London, a little fence eight or ten feet from our windows formed a barrier between the two properties, as is usual in England. The house of the alderman had a pretty yard covered with turf, surrounded, like our own, by a fence. My son had arranged a small flower bed in the little space which he called his garden. He entered this by the window of our sitting room, where I always sat with my work. His sister Charlotte often accompanied him to the garden. As we were living in an out-of-the-way place, hardly anyone ever passed our house. End of Part 2, Chapter 8「2 Chapter 9 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Return to Paris. The summer of 1799 passed without anything unusual. Lady Jerningham was again settled at Cossey, where she had invited me to rejoin her and pass the six months of her sojourn in the country. The lease of our house at Richmond, which she had taken for us, was on the point of expiring, and it would have been hardly considerate on our part to ask her to renew it, with the view of not accepting the hospitality which she had offered us. My aunt was alone at Cossey. Her niece, Fanny Dillon, my cousin, whom she had brought up, had just married Sir Thomas Webb, a Catholic baronet, who was quite an ordinary man, although very well born. Her eldest son, George Jerningham, had also married a Miss Sulliard, a very beautiful young lady belonging to an old and noble Catholic family. William Jerningham was in Germany. Her favourite son, Edward, had not left her, and that was all that was necessary. Under these circumstances, it would have been a real disgrace for us not to go to Cossy. We were making our preparations accordingly to set out, when there arrived the news of the unexpected return from Egypt of General Bonaparte, who had landed at Fréjus. On learning of this event, we left at once for Cossy with the hope of being able soon to go over to the continent and perhaps to return to France. It was during our sojourn there that we received the happy news of the fall of the Directory and of the revolution of 18 Brumaire, some time later, we received letters from Monsieur de Brocan and our brother-in-law, the Marquis de la Mette, urging us to return to France by way of Holland, with German passports. Lady Jerningham proposed that my husband should leave alone. This would perhaps have been better on account of the state of my health, but no consideration could determine me to be separated from my husband for an indefinite time. The communications between England and France in time of war might be entirely interrupted. The news which we received from Hamburg was often a month old. So we rejected all the propositions of Lady Jerningham. A Danish passport was sent from London for my husband, my children and myself. We set out for Yarmouth with the idea of taking passage on a packet of the Royal Navy. At this time, there were no steamboats. Our wait at Yarmouth was prolonged during the whole month of December. We did not dare to return to Cossey, although the distance was only 18 miles, as the captain had declared that as soon as the wind became favourable, that is to say from the southeast, he would sail immediately. 
he would hardly consent to let us remain on land, as he was in such haste to leave as soon as possible. Every courier brought dispatches from the government. Never had I passed such tedious days as during the month we were at Yarmouth. We were living in a very poor lodging with two rooms, and we were not able to go out, for the weather was frightful. The contrary winds blew with fury. Every day the reports of vessels which had been lost. You can imagine how such news was of a nature to discourage persons who might be called upon to embark at any moment. Finally, one morning, they came to inform us that it was necessary to go on board, where our baggage had been already for a long time. Hardly had we set foot on deck when the anchor was lifted. The sea was very rough, and we had a very disagreeable passage, which lasted forty-eight hours. About the middle of the second night, we were for some hours uncertain as to whether or not we might be left on Heligoland, a little island off the mouth of the Elbe, in case the current did not loosen the ice. The captain subsequently declared that, on account of the violent weather, if the wind had veered a single point to the north, he would have been forced to return to England without attempting to land. Fortunately, we escaped both of these eventualities. After having passed the island of Heligoland, we entered the Elbe, and moored in the offing of the little port of Cookshaven, which we did not enter. The captain was in haste to be relieved of his passengers. Everything was thrown pell-mell into the longboat. My husband and my maid left with my son. As for myself, the captain, on account of the state of my health, put me with my little girl in his private boat, and ordered the two sailors to land me as near as possible to the city. This injunction was nearly fatal to me. The tide being low, when we came alongside the jetty, I found much difficulty in landing. The two sailors seized me then by the wrists, and in spite of the motion of the boat, they would not let go, fortunately, for I certainly should have fallen into the sea. Then they hoisted me on the jetty in such a manner that for several moments I was suspended by the arms. They left me then alone with my little Charlotte. Although I was feeling very ill, I was forced, nevertheless, to set out to meet my husband, whom I perceived at a distance in a small wagon in which were our baggage and my maid. I felt a violent pain in my right side, and I have always thought since that I suffered some internal injury. We were obliged to knock at the door of two or three inns without being able to find a lodging on account of the number of emigres who were leaving for or arriving from England. Finally, we succeeded in persuading one innkeeper to give us temporary quarters. A few moments later, I was taken with a violent fever and was out of my head. My husband, who was very anxious, sent for a doctor. After a long search, they brought back one, who did not speak a word of French. He applied a plaster to my side and ordered me a calming draught, which caused me to sleep continuously for twenty-four hours. On waking up, I felt all right again. While I was asleep, my husband had purchased for two hundred francs a little old caleche, which was sufficiently spacious to contain us all. After a second day of repose, we set out in this open carriage in the month of January in the north of Germany. Fortunately, the weather was favourable the first days of our journey. The fourth day, a torrential rain did not cease to fall. Marguerite and I were somewhat protected by the back of the caleche, but my husband and my son, in spite of an umbrella, were wet to the skin. We remained two days at Bremen to dry our clothes behind the fine large stoves which you find in the German houses, and also to obtain a little repose. Then the weather became fine and we again set out. Much snow had fallen, and it was difficult to distinguish the route in the plains of heather which we were traversing. Towards evening, we arrived at the little city of Wildeshausen, where we were to pass the night. It was situated in the electorate of Hanover, 
and had consequently a Hanoverian garrison. The officers that day were giving a great ball to another regiment which was passing through. All the rooms of the only inn in the locality were occupied. We found refuge in the vestibule near the stove, and were very sad over the prospect of passing the night upon the wooden benches, when an officer all dressed for the ball came gallantly to say to me in English that, as he was to pass the whole night at the ball, he would place his room at my disposal. There we went for supper. A little later I was taken very ill, and the proprietor of the hotel sent a messenger to the end of the city to awaken an old hairdresser, a Frenchman by origin who had been settled at Wildeshausen since the Seven Years' War. He arrived very promptly, as he had not yet gone to bed on account of the ball. His first care was to run in search of a physician who lived in the vicinity. The doctor, an elegant young man, arrived wearing white gloves. He had left the ball and was still out of breath from his last waltz. His acquaintance with the French language comprised only several medical phrases. The old perruquier Denis fortunately came to our rescue to explain the nature of my malady. He asked if I could be transported without trouble to two rooms which he knew were to let at the end of the city. The doctor consented, and then returned to the ball. Denis ran to awaken the proprietor of these rooms, and before daybreak I was settled there. The house, like all those of the prosperous peasants of this part of Germany, had a large porte cochere by which you entered a large carriage house, which occupied the whole depth of the house. In front, at right and left of this carriage house on the ground floor, were two good rooms, very neat and quite well furnished. Marguerite and my two children took one, while I was placed in the larger room, and my husband took possession of a small cabinet adjoining. The following morning, the 13th of February, 1800, was born my little girl, to whom we gave the name of Cécile. The following day, the bailiff of the locality, who had already sent once in search of our passport, dispatched one of the village guards to lead Monsieur de la Tour du Pin to him. He said to my husband in good French, So your Danish passport is under a false name. You are French and an emigre. And in the electorate of Hanover, where you are now, it is forbidden to allow the sojourn of French emigres more than 48 hours. My husband was terrified by this discourse. He alleged that I was not in a state to be transported. But the bailiff was inflexible as to the departure of my husband and declared that before the end of the day he must take his choice between leaving for Hanover and returning to Bremen. Then he added, Sir, since you acknowledge that you are French, let me know your real name. La Tour du Pain. Ha, oh, mon Dieu, cried the bailiff. Are you the former minister of France to the Hague? Exactly. Well, sir, if this is so, remain here as long as you wish. My nephew, Monsieur Inuba, a very young man, was minister of Hanover at the Hague. He often visited your house, and you were very kind to him. From this moment... He placed himself at our disposal with the greatest zeal. In two weeks I was up again, and at the end of another week we set out, after having taken tea with the bailiff, the burgomaster, and the curate. As there was a Catholic church at Wildeshausen, my little daughter was baptised there. She was held at the font by the old perruquier and his wife, who during the forty years of their marriage had never learned a word of French. We took the route of Lingen to enter Holland. For several leagues we were accompanied by a number of young men. Before leaving, they insisted that I should drink a cup of a German mixture of which they had prepared the ingredients. I thought it would be detestable, but nevertheless, after having tasted it, I found the beverage delicious. It was composed of warm Bordeaux wine in which they had put yolks of eggs and spices. The doctor 
was among those who had accompanied me, and it was by his advice that I swallowed this mixture, which somewhat inebriated me. The worthy fellows of our escort then left us and wished us with fervour a bon voyage. Their wish brought us good fortune, for nothing troublesome happened, and my little girl endured the trip in an astonishing manner for a baby who was not a month old. We finally arrived at Utrecht, and my husband went at once to The Hague in order to obtain a passport en règle from the ambassador of the French Republic, Monsieur de Semonville. The latter, who turned with each wind which blew, had already succeeded in pleasing the new government of which Bonaparte was the head. My husband had known Monsieur de Semonville very intimately for a long time, so he was received with open arms and they fabricated for him a superb passport, attesting that he had not left Utrecht since the 18 Fructidor. During the short absence of Monsieur de la Tour du Pain, Madame Denis, by the merest chance, passed through Utrecht, and my husband was very much surprised to find his aunt on his return from his trip to The Hague. I think that Madame Denis was on her way to see Monsieur de Lafayette, who had been living at Vianne and near Utrecht since his release from prison, after the peace of Campo Formio. I do not recall whether she had come from France or England. She always had two or three passports, and changed her name and her route at every moment. We remained two days with her, and then, taking advantage of a carriage which was being sent to Paris, and which we were charged to deliver at its destination, we set out. On arriving at Paris, we stopped at the Hôtel Grange Batelier. My brother-in-law Lamette and our friend Bruquin were at Paris. Monsieur de Lamette installed us in a charming little house, entirely furnished, Rue de Miramigny, which had been occupied prior to that by two or three friends, who had just left to go and pass the whole summer in the country. We were predestined to live in the houses of courtesans. That at Richmond belonged to an actress. This one had been arranged for Mademoiselle Michelot, former mistress of the Duc de Bourbon. All the walls were ornamented with mirrors with such prodigality that I was obliged to hang pieces of muslin to conceal the greater part of them, and I was much annoyed at not being able to move without encountering my form reflected from head to foot. At Paris, I found many persons of my acquaintance who had already returned from the emigration. All the young people from this moment turned their eyes towards the rising sun, Madame Bonaparte, who was installed at the Tuileries, where the apartments had been entirely refurnished as if by enchantment. She already put on the airs of a queen, but of a queen the most gracious, the most amiable, the most kind-hearted. Although she had very little intelligence, she had nevertheless well penetrated the projects of her husband. The first consul had given his wife the mission of bringing to him la haute société, having been persuaded by Josephine that she belonged to it, which was not strictly true. I do not know whether she had ever been presented at court or visited at Versailles, but thanks to the name of her first husband, Monsieur de Beauharnais, the thing was certainly possible. During the years 1787 to 1791, I met Monsieur de Beauharnais constantly in society. As he had seen my husband frequently when he was aide-de-camp of Monsieur de Bouille during the war in America, Monsieur de Beauharnais said to him one day, Come and see me, so that I may present you to my wife. My husband went there once, but never went again. The society which met in their salon was not ours. Monsieur de Beauharnais nevertheless went everywhere, for during the war he had formed ties with a number of leaders of high society. He had a charming figure and had the reputation justly of being the finest dancer in Paris. I had often danced with him, and I therefore experienced a very painful feeling when I heard of his death on the scaffold. 
I again saw Monsieur de Talleyrand, who was always animated by the same sentiments towards me, amiable, without being really useful. During the past two years he had worked so successfully at increasing his fortune that I found him settled in a beautiful house, his personal property, in the Rue d'Anjou. He laughed in his sleeve at the disposition on the part of all those who had returned to France to rally to the government. He said to me, Que fait Gourané? Veut-il quelque chose? Non, I replied. Nous comptons aller nous installer à Bouy. Tant pis, he exclaimed. C'est une bêtise. Mais, I replied, nous ne sommes pas en état de rester à Paris. Pah, he said, on a toujours de l'argent quand on veut. Voilà l'homme. As soon as Madame Bonaparte learned, through Madame de Valence and Madame de Montesson, of my presence in Paris, she wished to come and see me. To draw to her a woman still young, a former lady of honour, very much in vogue, would be a conquest, if I dare say so, of which she was very impatient to boast to the first consul. In order to give value to my condescension, I allowed myself to be implored a little. Then, one morning, I went with Madame de Valence to call on Madame Bonaparte. I found in the salon a number of ladies and a group of young men, all of whom I knew. Madame Bonaparte came to me crying, Ah, la voilà! She seated me beside her and said a thousand pleasant things, repeating all the time, Comme elle a l'air anglais, which ceased to be a praiseworthy trait a short time later. She examined me from head to foot and her attention was particularly drawn to a tress of blonde hair which surrounded my head, and from which her eyes could not be drawn. As we rose to leave, she could not refrain from demanding in a low tone of Madame de Valence if this tress was indeed my own hair. Madame Bonaparte spoke to me with much kindness of Madame Dillon, my stepmother, and expressed a warm desire to make the acquaintance of my sister Fanny who was at the same time her cousin, the mother of Madame Dillon and of Josephine, having been sisters. Then she continued by saying all the émigrés were going to return and that she was charmed and that they had suffered enough and that General Bonaparte wished above everything else to bring to an end the evils of the revolution and so on. In short, a lot of reassuring statements. She also asked for news of Monsieur de la Tour du Pain and evinced a desire of seeing him. She was leaving for Ma Maison and invited me to come there. She was very pleasant in every way, and I saw clearly that the first consul had entrusted to her the department of the ladies of the court and the task of their conquest when she met them. The task was not very difficult for all were rushing towards the rising power, and I did not know anyone except myself who refused to be lady of honour to the Empress Josephine. Monsieur de la Tour du Pain and I had never been inscribed, I cannot explain why, upon the list of emigres. It was necessary, however, for us to obtain a certificate of residence in France signed by nine witnesses an indispensable formality of which, nevertheless, no one was dupe. With this end, we went to the municipality of the quarter with our squad of witnesses. When the certificate was signed and clothed with all the necessary mensonges, the mayor said to me in a low tone, that does not prevent you from bringing from London all your effects. Then he began to laugh. What a comedy! The place in Paris during the summer where the most distinguished company was brought together was under the arch of a house in the Place de Vendôme, that which forms the angle of the Place on the right in going towards the Rue Saint-Honoré and on the side of that street. It was there that the Commission of the Emigres held its sessions, a tribunal very easy to conciliate 
if you did not come with empty hands. In the crowds which assembled at this point you met the greatest personages mingled with brokers of every kind. The French find amusement in everything. The commission of emigres had become a place of reunions. People made appointments there. They went there to meet former acquaintances, to talk over their plans, their choice of residence. Many of those who came back considered the place as an employment bureau. We had no business with this commission, as we did not figure on the list of emigres. It was necessary, however, to have erased from this list the name of my mother-in-law. Although she had resided for thirty years in the convent of the Dame Anglaise of the Rue des Fossés Saint-Victor, which she had never left, they had nevertheless inscribed her name. The sale of all the furniture of the Chateau of Tesson and of the two farmhouses had been the consequence of this unjustifiable inscription. One morning I went to Malmaison. It was after the Battle of Marengo. Madame Bonaparte gave me a wonderful reception, and after luncheon, which was served in a charming salle à manger, she invited me to see her picture gallery. We were alone, and she took advantage of the occasion to tell me the story of the origin of the masterpieces which the gallery contained. This fine picture had been presented to her by the Pope, Two others had been given her by Canova. The city of Milan had offered her this picture and that. Having a great admiration for the conqueror of Marengo, I should have esteemed Madame Bonaparte more highly if she had told me that all these masterpieces had been conquered at the point of his sword. The good woman was naturally a liar even when the simple truth would have been more interesting and more piquant than a lie, she would have preferred to lie. Madame de Stael had given up her house. Her husband had returned to Sweden, where he died two years later. After having settled in a small apartment, she was preparing to go to join her father at Coppe. Bonaparte could not endure her, though she tried in every way to please him. I think that she never went to see Madame Bonaparte. One day, however, I met Josephine Bonaparte in her salon. She received people of all the regimes. The emigres returned to France, mingled at her house with the former partisans of the directory. End of part two, chapter nine. Part 2, Chapter 10 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 10, 1800 to 1808. Life at Le Buil. Finally, about the month of September, we decided to leave for Le Buil. About three years before, we had sold our house in Paris at a very low price. It was situated in a bad quarter, the Rue du Bac. I no longer remember the disposition which my husband made of the proceeds of this sale. On his return, he found the affairs of his father as well as his own in such great disorder and he was so unfortunate in everything he undertook that in spite of his intelligence and his capacity, he did not seem to succeed in anything. My husband set out alone for Tesson, and I engaged a driver who took me home by short journeys in a large carriage which held, besides myself, my son, my two daughters, the instructor, Monsieur de Cologne, and my maid, Marguerite. We finally arrived at Le Buil, where I was happy to be once more. I had great need of repose. An excellent girl, whom I had left there, had taken care of everything in good shape. My husband arrived a few days later, and we finally found ourselves all reunited in our home. My husband devoted himself to agriculture and the education of his son, in which I assisted, 
in order that he should not forget his English. Humbert was then ten and a half years of age, while Charlotte was four and Cécile six months. My excellent maid Marguerite devoted herself with as much attention and tenderness to the dear children as I did myself. A short time after our arrival at Le Bouille, a cousin of my husband, Madame de Morville, came to stay with us. She had lost all the property which she possessed in France, and her principal resource was a pension of forty pounds sterling paid to her by the English government. This had been given her as the widow of a general officer of the French navy who had taken service with England. A thing which I may say in passing was very villainous. Madame de Morville was very fond of Monsieur La Tour du Pain. She was four years older than he and had known him since his childhood. She was very happy to be with us. Madame Denin came to Le Wheel on several occasions during the eight years we resided there. At the time of her first visit, which lasted several months, she brought Elisa, the daughter of Monsieur Lally, who had just left the school of Madame Campan. I was asked to undertake finishing her education. Mademoiselle de Lally at that time was fifteen years of age, and I received her with pleasure. She was a sweet, good child, quite well grounded in orthography, music and dancing, while the cultivation of her mind had been almost completely neglected. I looked at the mission which had been confided to me as a heavy charge and a great responsibility to take. Nevertheless, my husband urged me to accept, and his wish for me was a law against which the thought of resisting never occurred to me. As we were not in a state of fortune easily to increase our expenses, my aunt arranged that Monsieur de Lally should pay us, as pension for his daughter, a sum equivalent to that which he had paid for her with Madame Campan. To accept such a condition seemed to me a backward step on our part. Nevertheless, we submitted. Besides this, Monsieur de Lally undertook the charge of paying the personal expenses of his daughter. Elisa had no ground to complain of these arrangements, and I am able to say that we also had no reason to regret them. In assuming the education of Mademoiselle de Lally, I was only doing what it was necessary for me to undertake later on with my own daughters. My husband, for his part, undertook to teach her history and geography. I took charge of the English lessons, and the instructor of my son gave her lessons in Italian. Our reading aloud was also of benefit to her. She was very fond of my children especially of Cécile, whose first education she began. We were preoccupied, my husband and I, with the future of our children, and this was not the least of the disquietudes which the bad state of our affairs caused us. The estate of Le Buil, reduced to its bare land value, represented very little the war with England had reduced the price of wines to almost nothing, especially white wines, already at this time of little value in our part of the country. This wine could then be bought at from four to five francs a barrel. My husband installed an equipment for making eau de vie and went to quite heavy expense to put this apparatus in working order but the profits from this commerce permitted us at least to live. Soon it was necessary for us to think of the future of our son, which was our principal concern. My aunt and Monsieur Lally wrote us from Paris that all the persons whom we had formerly known had rallied to the government. The Concordat had just been published and the re-establishment of religion had a prodigious effect in the provinces. Until this moment, divine services were only held in private rooms, if not entirely in secret, and the priests were almost always returned emigres. 
There was therefore universal joy when Monsieur W. de Sanzai, a man highly esteemed, was appointed Archbishop at Bordeaux. We had the honour of entertaining him at Le Bouille during the first two days which followed his taking possession of the diocese. We brought together to receive him all the good cures of our former estate, which comprised nineteen parishes. The greater part, recently appointed, had returned from foreign countries. Others had been concealed with their parishioners or in private houses. Our Archbishop was adored by all, and his entry into Bordeaux was a triumph. The gratitude which all felt went out to the great man who held the reins of government. When he proclaimed himself consul for life, this gratitude was shown by the almost unanimous approbation of those who were called upon to vote upon this proposition. A little later there appeared in the communes the lists upon which it was necessary for the voters to inscribe their names and respond by yes or no to the question as to whether the consul for life shall be proclaimed emperor. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin was in a state of great indecision before he decided to write yes upon the list at Saint Andre de Cubzac. I saw him walk up and down alone in the garden, but I did not try to penetrate his thoughts. Finally, one evening, he entered, and I learned with pleasure that he had just written yes as a result of his reflections. In 1805, I went with Elise Lally to pass some time at Bordeaux. One day at Mass, Elisa was observed by a young man, the most distinguished in Bordeaux by birth, face and fortune, Monsieur Henri Do. Elisa was very small, but she had a superb head of black hair, very brilliant colour, the freshness of a rose and the handsomest eyes in the world. Our friend Bulletin, after the loss of his fortune, caused by the failure of his company which furnished provisions for the army, had returned to take up his residence at Bordeaux for an indefinite time. He learned through friends that Monsieur Henri Dor had spoken in terms of eulogy to certain of his comrades of the young lady who was being brought up by Madame de la Tour du Pin, and declared that none of the young ladies of Bordeaux had so pleasant and agreeable a manner. He asked for information regarding us, our manner of life, and so on. My husband, who had been named President of the Canton, without having solicited the office, had gone to Paris for the coronation. I wrote him of the gossip which had been reported to me, and he spoke of it to Monsieur de Lally. The latter was then taken up with the endeavour to secure the repayment of quite a large sum of money which the State owed him, since the rehabilitation of his father and the cancellation of his death penalty, that is to say, since three years before the Revolution. This indebtedness of the State had been recognised as valid by the Council of State, but the sum having been reduced two-thirds, like all the funds, did not amount to more than a hundred thousand francs. Napoleon, who desired to rally Monsieur de Lally to his government, wished that the reclamation should be entirely successful. When my husband spoke to Monsieur de Lally of the contents of my letter, he declared without hesitation that if he received this sum, he would give it to his daughter the day of her marriage. You will see how he kept his word. We arranged to go to Bordeaux for the carnival season in order to give Monsieur Do the chance of seeing Elisa at the balls which were given in the salons of the former intendance. About this time, I had the great sorrow of losing our dear maid, Marguerite, whom I loved as a mother. This caused me very sincere grief. My husband had seen at Paris several persons of his acquaintance, all of whom had entered the service of the government, 
among them Monsieur Marais, afterwards Duc de Bassano. They urged him to attempt to obtain some employment. Without exactly refusing, he replied that if the Emperor wished to have his services, he well knew where he could find him, and that the role of a solicitor did not please him. Monsieur de Talleyrand could not comprehend reluctance of this kind, but he felt nevertheless in his mind rather than his heart that there was a sort of distinction in not mingling with the crowd of solicitors. He only said, shrugging his shoulders, Cela viendra, and then he thought no more about it. My husband returned to Le Bouille. He had seen Monsieur Malloway, who had just been named Préfet Maritime at Antwerp, in charge of the large shipyards there to which he gave so tremendous an impetus. These gentlemen had come to an understanding that when Humbert was seventeen years of age, he should receive a position in the office of Monsieur Malloway. The Institution des Auditeurs Conseil d'État was not then in existence. They had commenced, however, to talk of it, and we were of the opinion that it would be useful for a young man who was destined for business to work for a time under the eyes of a man as keen and competent as Monsieur Malouet. As he had much friendship for us, we could entrust our son to him with entire confidence. The thought of this separation, nevertheless, weighed heavily on my heart. The 18th of October, 1806, as I was dressing in the morning, I saw, passing on the terrace, our good Dr. Dupuis, who had been at Le Bouille for several days. I asked him laughingly where he had come from so early in the morning. He replied that he had just been to report the death of one of our neighbours, who had passed away suddenly in getting up that morning. I knew this person very well and had had a long talk with her only the evening before. This event upset me to such a degree that that very morning I gave birth to my youngest son, Aymar, the only one of my children who is living at this writing. In the meantime, we had not lost sight of the important affair of the marriage of Elisa, under pretext of having our baby vaccinated, we went about Christmas time to pass six weeks at Bordeaux with our excellent friend Brucon. He had succeeded in winning to our side Monsieur de Mabotin de Couteneau, former Councillor of Parliament, the uncle of Monsieur Do. His wife, having been the sister of the mother of Monsieur Do, this young man, after the death of his mother, which happened a long time before, felt towards his aunt a real filial affection. Monsieur de Couteneau desired to re-enter the judicature, and Monsieur de Lally was understood to have very good standing with the government. This was another reason which led Monsieur de Couteneau to favour the marriage of his nephew. Besides this, pride apart, we enjoyed such consideration of Bordeaux that a person admitted into our family life would have a certain standing. The young people met at several balls. They also met on the street and at church, where we were always sure to see Monsieur Do. Finally, one day, Madame de Couteneau presented herself officially at my house to ask for the hand of the young lady for her nephew. As a good old diplomatist, I replied that I was ignorant of the plans of Monsieur de Lally for his daughter but that Monsieur de la Tour du Pain would go to see him at Le Bouil, where he was at the moment, and present the proposition to him. My husband went there, as arranged, and returned the following day with Monsieur de Lally. All was soon arranged. Then followed the congratulations, the dinners, the evening entertainments. We received a call from the aged father of Monsieur Do. He was a gentleman of the olden days, without the least vestige of intelligence or instruction. It was said that he had bored his wife to death. This did not prevent him, however, from possessing more than 60,000 francs of income. 
The day of the signature of the contract, Monsieur de Lally counted out for Monsieur Do, as he had agreed, a hundred bags of one thousand francs, representing the Do of his daughter. It was the only time in my life that I ever saw so much money at one time. The marriage took place at Le Buil, the 1st of April, 1807. At this season there were no flowers except little pink and white marguerites. Madame de Morville, Charlotte and I constructed a charming Ypern for the dinner, the bottom of which was of moss with the names of Henri and Elisa, written in flowers. All these preliminaries and the marriage itself had very much upset me and taken me out of my tranquil and regular habits. I was therefore very glad to return home, to enjoy the last months which my son was to pass with us. My aunt and Monsieur de Lally returned to Paris, and I remained alone with Madame de Mauville. End of part two, chapter ten. Part two, chapter eleven of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Eighteen hundred and eight, the Emperor at Bordeaux. Bordeaux was very much taken up with the affairs of Spain, and several refugees from that country had already arrived there. My aunt wrote us from Paris that the Emperor was to go to Spain accompanied perhaps by the Empress Josephine, and that Monsieur de Bassano would form part of his suite. She advised her nephew to pay his court to the Emperor, and to see Monsieur de Bassano, who was interested in him. My husband received this letter at the moment when he was setting out on horseback for Tesson. A matter of business absolutely claimed his presence there. In leaving, he said, that he would be gone only two days, and that he had plenty of time to go and return. The very next day, the order was received at the posting station to prepare horses for the emperor. This news filled me with despair, but I was nonetheless anxious to see this extraordinary man. Madame de Morville, my daughter Charlotte, and I went to Cubzac, resolved not to return before we had seen Napoleon. We demanded hospitality from Ribet, the Grand Commissionnaire de Transport, who knew us and who installed us in a room looking out on the port. The brigantine destined for the passage of the Dodogne was already there, with the sailors at their posts. The whole population of the country lined the road. The peasants, while cursing the man who took their children to send them away to war, wished to see him nevertheless. A first courier arrived. People tried to question him. General Drouet d'Elon, the commander of the department, asked him when the emperor would arrive. The man was so fatigued that the only response they could get from him was the word passant. His horse was saddled, he accompanied it on the boat, then fell at the bottom of the boat like a dead man, and it was necessary to rouse him and put him on his horse on the other side of the river. After the passage of the courier, our impatience was very great. As for myself, I was taken up with the fatality which kept my husband far from the place where his functions demanded his presence. The municipality of Cubzac was present, and he, the president of the canton, whose place was there, was absent. It was an occasion lost which might not return. I felt very much put out. Finally, after a wait which lasted the entire day, towards evening, a first carriage arrived, and a little later, a berline with eight horses escorted by a picket of cavalry stopped under the window where we were. The emperor descended, dressed in the uniform of Chasseur de la Garde. Two chamberlains, one of whom was Monsieur de Barral, and an aide-de-camp accompanied him. The mayor paid his compliments. The 
Emperor listened with an air of great boredom, then entered the brigantine which immediately set out. This was all we saw of the great man. We returned to Le Bouil, all three of us, tired out and in bad humour. The next day my husband arrived. I gave him only time to eat his breakfast and then forced him to set out for Bordeaux, where the Empress was expected the next day. Immediately on his arrival he went to see Monsieur Marais, who professed for him much friendship and interest. He found him kind and obliging, but what was his astonishment when Monsieur de Marais said to him, You have felt much annoyance over the necessity of going to Tesson exactly at the time that the Emperor was passing your home, and you have shown great diligence in returning. You have then seen Bouquin, replied Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. No. But then how do you know all that? The Emperor told me. You can imagine how much my husband was surprised. Madame de la Tour du Pin should come to Bordeaux, added Monsieur Marais. She should remain here during the time of the sojourn of the Empress. There will be an assembly tomorrow, and the Emperor wishes that she should be present. My husband immediately sent a carriage for me, for it was not a time to hesitate. I had several dresses at Bordeaux, made at the time that I was taking Elisa to the balls, and to evening entertainments given at the time of her marriage. But among these, there was no black dress, and the court was in mourning. The assembly was for eight o'clock, and it was already five. Fortunately, I had a pretty robe of grey satin. I added several dark ornaments. The good coiffure arranged some black ribbons in my hair, and this seemed to me very appropriate for a woman of thirty-eight who can say without vanity that she did not have the air of being more than thirty. The reunion was in the large salle à manger of the palace. I knew very few persons at Bordeaux. Sixty or eighty ladies were present. We were arranged according to a list read aloud by the Chamberlain, Monsieur de Bayan. He enjoined us that no one was to leave her place under any pretext, as otherwise it would be impossible for him to find the name to give to each person. This sort of military manoeuvre had hardly been arranged when a loud voice announced, L'Empereur! which caused my heart to beat. He began at the end of the line and addressed a word to each lady. As he approached the place where I was standing, the Chamberlain said a word in his ear. He fixed his eyes on me, smiling graciously, and when my turn came he said to me laughing in a familiar tone, while he regarded me from head to foot, Why, you are not then afflicted over the death of the King of Denmark? Not sufficiently, sire, I replied, to sacrifice the pleasure of being presented to your majesty. I had no black dress. Oh, that is an excellent reason. And then he added, you were in the country. Speaking then to the lady beside me, he said, your name, madame? She stammered, and he did not comprehend. Montesquieu, I said. Ah, oh, really, that is a fine name to have. I went this morning to La Bred to see the cabinet of Montesquieu. The poor woman replied, thinking that she had found a fine inspiration, C'est un bon citoyen. This word, citoyen, displeased the emperor. He gave Madame de Montesquieu with his eagle eyes a look which would have terrified her if she had understood, and replied very briskly, Menon said it on grand homme. And then, shrugging his shoulders, he looked at me as if to say, Que cette femme est bête. The Empress followed at some distance behind the Emperor, and the ladies were named to her in the same order. But before she arrived at my place, the valet de chambre came to request me to go to the salon to await Her Majesty. When the Empress entered the salon, she showed herself very amiable for me, and for my husband, whom she had also summoned. She expressed the desire to see me every evening during her sojourn at Bordeaux, and then began to play backgammon with Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. They served tea and ices. 
I was still in hopes of seeing the Emperor again, and my disappointment was great when I learned that upon the arrival of a courier from Bayonne, he had immediately left Bordeaux to go there. The Emperor, having all Spain and all Europe on his hands, to use the common expression, had nevertheless the time to dictate the order of the day of the Empress in the most minute detail, even to the toilettes which she was to wear. She would neither have wished nor dared to change this in the slightest particular, unless she was sick in bed. I learned from Madame Marais that the Emperor had ordered that we should come, my husband and I, every day to pass the evening, which we did. However, the poor Empress was beginning to be cruelly disturbed over the rumours of divorce, which were already being circulated. She spoke of it to Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, who reassured her as well as possible. He endeavoured to stop the confidences which the imprudent and light-headed Josephine seemed disposed to make to him, and which it seemed to him indiscreet to hear. She was much turned against Monsieur de Talleyrand, whom she accused of urging the Emperor to obtain a divorce. No one was better aware of this fact than my husband, for he had talked the matter over with him during the trip he made to Paris, but he took care not to let Josephine know this. Accustomed to the adulation of some, the deception of others, she found great relief in talking with my husband and opened her heart to him on a subject which she had not dared to broach to any persons of her entourage. She was very desirous of leaving for Bayonne, and demanded every day of Ordiner, When do we go? To which he replied with his German accent, Indeed, I do not yet know. One evening, I was seated beside the Empress at the tea-table when she received a note of several lines from the Emperor. Leaning towards me, she said very low, He writes like a cat. I cannot read this last phrase. At the same time, she handed me the note while putting her finger upon her lips as a sign of mystery. I had only the time to read several thousand these, and then the last phrase, thus worded. I have here the father and the son. This gives me much embarrassment. Since then, this note has been quoted in a dispatch, but much amplified. There were only five or six lines written upon a sheet of paper which had been torn and folded in two. If it were shown to me, I should recognise it. After tea, General Ordiner approached the Empress and said to her, Your Majesty will leave tomorrow at midday. At this decision, everyone rejoiced. The surgeon at Bordeaux had been a cause of expense for me, as it had been necessary during the ten days to be in full dress every evening. I was crazy to return to my children. Elisa, on account of her baby, was not able to come to see the Empress, to her great regret. She had been present only at the Assembly, where she received a very flattering reception. Her husband had entered the Mounted Guard of Honour, which was composed of all the most distinguished young men of Bordeaux. We returned accordingly to Le Bouille, and notwithstanding the fine reception from the distinguished personages whom we had seen at Bordeaux, we entertained only small hopes for the future. How could I believe, indeed, that a man averse to all intrigue, unknown, so to speak, to those in power, since he had not mingled in any of the events for the past few years, living retired at his chateau, in a retreat all the more profound, because he was almost without fortune, how could I suppose, I say, that he should have attracted the eye of the eagle, who was the master of the destinies of France? My husband had remained at Bordeaux to finish some business, and I was seated beside my lamp, talking with my poor cousin, Madame Joseph de la Tour du Pin, whom we had received at our house through kindness. At this moment, as nine o'clock was striking, a peasant sent expressly from Bordeaux arrived with a note from my husband, in which were written only these words, I am Prefect of Brussels. Of Brussels? 
only ten leagues from Antwerp. I admit that I experienced a great joy in which the thought of again seeing my son touched me above all. Monsieur Marais was ignorant of the vacancy in this prefecture. The papers of the Minister of the Interior arrived at Bayonne exactly as if he had been present at the Tuileries or at Saint Cloud. For nothing was allowed to change the habits of the Emperor. He was upsetting the Spanish monarchy and sending to prison or into exile the two kings, father and son. This gave him, quote, much embarrassment, as I had read written in his own hand. But in spite of that, when the work of the minister arrived, he read, rectified and changed the nominations. Préfecture de la Dille, a name is proposed for this post. He takes his pen, erases it, and writes above it, La Tour du Pain. That is what we learn later from Monsieur Marais, who never raised any objection, but who also never made any proposition. He was a very useful machine. My son was at Antwerp, seated at his desk as secretary to Monsieur Malouet, when he saw the latter running across the court. Never had anyone seen Monsieur Malouet, the most dignified of men, hasten his pace for any reason whatsoever. On entering, he cried, your father is préfet of Brussels. Dear Ambert, how great was his joy. Several days before the departure of my husband from Le Wheel to go to Brussels, I received a courier in great haste from our friend Bruquin, who announced that he had sent a carriage to Cubzac. He informed me at the same time that King Charles the Fourth of Spain and his unworthy wife were to arrive at Bordeaux at the palace, and that the Emperor had given orders that I should serve as a lady of honour to the Queen during her sojourn at Bordeaux, which would be for two or three days. Fortunately, all my ceremonial costumes were still with Monsieur de Brocain. My packing was therefore soon finished. My husband accompanied me, and we set out. Arrived at Bordeaux, I dressed hastily and went to the palace where their Spanish majesties had just arrived. On entering the salon, I found some gentlemen of my acquaintance who cried, Come at once, we are awaiting you for dinner. This was very agreeable to me, for I had taken only a cup of tea before leaving. The king and queen had retired to their own apartment with the Prince de la Paix. I met Monsieur Dodena and Monsieur de Monnoir, the one écuyer, the other chamberlain to the emperor, a few others, and two or three Spaniards, whose names I did not know and who did not speak French. We immediately sat down to dinner. These gentlemen told me two other ladies of honour had been named, one of whom was Elisa Do, and I was charged to notify them to be at the palace the next day at midday. The next day at eleven o'clock I went to the palace, and Monsieur de Monnoir requested to enter the Queen's apartment to present me. Turning to me before opening the door, he said, Don't laugh. This, of course, gave me a desire to, and in truth there was sufficient reason. There I saw the most surprising and unexpected spectacle. La Reine d'Espagne c'était au milieu de la chambre devant une grande psyché, au la lacée. Elle avait pour tout vêtement une petite jupe de percale très étroite et très courte, et sur la poitrine, la plus sèche, la plus déchaînée, la plus noire que l'on pût voir, un mouchoir de gaz. Sur ses cheveux gris était disposée en guise de coiffure une guirlande de roses rouge et jaune. La reine s'avança vers moi, la femme de chambre, la lasson, toujours, en opérant ces mouvements de cour que l'on fait quand on veut, en termes de toilette, se retirer de son corset. Near her was the king and several other men whom I did not know. The queen demanded of Monsieur de Monnoir, Who is that lady? He told her. What is her name? She said. He repeated it and the Queen addressed several words in Spanish to the King, who replied by saying that I was, or that my name was, very noble. 
Then the Queen finished her toilette while relating that the Empress had given her several of her dresses, as she had brought none from Madrid. This degree of degradation gave me a very painful impression. The Sovereign, indeed, was wearing a gown of yellow crepe lined with satin of the same shade, which I remembered having seen the Empress wear. All desire to laugh had left me. I was more inclined to weep. When the Queen was dressed, she dismissed me. I went to the salon where I found Elisa, and together we awaited the arrival of the authorities whom I was to present to Her Majesty. At this moment, a fat man with a black plaster upon his forehead passed through the salon. I recognised him for the famous Prince de la Paix. He passed impolitely before us without saluting, and we both agreed that neither his face nor his figure justified the favours which the scandalous chronicles attributed to him. The salons were then filled, and the Queen was notified. I presented to her one by one the chiefs of the administration, commencing with the Archbishop, to whom alone she addressed a word. Monsieur de Monnoir did the same for the King, who showed himself more gracious. The following day I made a visit of a quarter of an hour in the morning, and there was the usual entertainment in the evening. The day after, to my great joy, I learned of the early departure of the members of the royal family of Spain. The préfet and the archbishop came to bid them adieu. Then we entered a carriage to go to the passage of the river, for at this time there was no bridge. We found there the brigantine already, and the crossing effectuated, I took leave of these unhappy sovereigns. The unfortunate king did not have the air for a single instant of comprehending the sadness of his situation. His attitude was completely lacking in dignity and seriousness. During the passage of the river he had talked all the time with my servant who was on the deck. He was a good German who could hardly believe that he had talked with a king. He said to me afterwards, Mais madame, il n'a donc pas de chagrin. Such is the history of my brief functions at the court of King Charles IV and of the Queen, his horrible wife. End of part two, chapter eleven. Part two, chapter twelve of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1808 to 1810, the Prefecture at Brussels. This was the commencement of a new life. I was to leave my garden, my chickens, my cows, my flowers, my regular and tranquil occupations which suited my taste, to lead an entirely different existence. But Providence had given me the desire to endeavour always to make the best of any situation in which I found myself. It was about nine o'clock in the evening, as I have said, when I received by messenger the note from my husband, announcing his nomination as Prefect of Brussels. When he arrived the following morning for breakfast, he found me already prepared to discuss the change in our existence, and the arrangements and plans which I thought we should make in consequence. Charlotte was then over eleven years of age, very advanced for her age, she had a great desire to be informed on all subjects. She had immediately begun to study all the geographical dictionaries regarding Belgium, to examine the maps of the country, and when her father, who knew her well, arrived and questioned her regarding the department of the deal, she already knew all the statistics. As for little Cécile, who was already a good musician at eight years of age, and also a good Italian scholar. Her first question was whether she would have a music teacher at Brussels. My husband immediately made all the necessary arrangements at Le Buil, but, unfortunately, confided his affairs to a man in whom he believed he could have entire confidence. To me, he left the care of closing the house and the packing. 
Monsieur de la Tour du Pin had received an order to report at Paris without delay, as Monsieur de Chabon, his predecessor, had already left Brussels to go to organise the Department of Tuscany, which had just been united to the Empire. Our friend Brouquin, happier even than my husband himself over his good fortune, came to pass several days with us, and they left for Paris together. The news of this nomination had surprised all those who for a long time had solicited favours without obtaining them. Nobody was willing to believe that the government had come to look for Monsieur de la Tour du Pain at his plough like Cincinnatus in order to give him the finest prefecture in France. This choice was, however, the most judicious that the wonderful foresight of Napoleon could have made, and for the following reason. Brussels was a conquered capital, and no effort had yet been made to attach it to France. The seat of the court and of high society, it had been governed up to the present time only by obscure and worthless representatives. Monsieur de Pontecoulant, the first préfet, was assuredly a man of birth and aristocratic leanings, a former officer of the French guards. His youth had been passed at Versailles and at Paris, and he would perhaps have succeeded at Brussels except for his wife, of whom I have already spoken. It was understood that she had saved his life during the terror. Formerly, she had been the mistress of Mirabeau, of whom Lejai, her first husband, was the librarian. It was said that she had been pretty, but if so, she did not retain the slightest vestige of beauty. After her marriage with Monsieur de Pontecoulon, she had been frequently seen in the Salon of Barras, and this did not exactly constitute a recommendation. Taken to Brussels by her husband, her antecedents had not been very attractive to the high and aristocratic society which formerly constituted the court of the Archduchess. Surrounded by French intriguers who had fallen upon Belgium as upon a prey, Monsieur de Pontecoulant did not give much time to the cares of the administration. The Emperor had recalled him, at the same time nominating him for the Senate, and had sent Monsieur de Chabon to replace him. The latter, who was an honest and enlightened man, a firm and excellent administrator, had reformed many abuses, punished breaches of trust, and dismissed the culpable parties. All his acts had been just and enlightened. It was only necessary for him to follow out this course to administer the country well. But he had not succeeded in overcoming the aloofness which the upper classes felt for the French government. This task was incumbent upon my husband, and I dare say upon me also, as the source of all influences found in the Salon. It is true that Monsieur de Chabon was married, but his wife, who was sickly, insignificant and of obscure origin, never received, and consequently nobody had ever seen her. I had been preceded at Brussels by a kind of romantic reputation, which I owed to my adventures in America. After having made all the arrangements at Le Buil and sent off by the wagon everything which we thought would be useful to us at Brussels, to diminish the very great expense of our establishment in a large mansion, I set out by post with Madame de Morville, my daughters, and my little son. A friend at Bordeaux, Monsieur Meyer, lent me a carriage which I sold for him at Brussels. En route, I passed three or four weeks at Paris with my aunt, who was then living with Monsieur de Lally in a fine house in the Rue Miroménil, which she has since sold. Madame Dillon had returned from England some time before. I went to see her, for she had received my husband very cordially when he visited Paris with Humbert the preceding year. My sister Fanny had grown up. She was then 
twenty-three years of age, and without being pretty had a very distinguished air. Several suitors had already presented themselves for her hand, but the one whom she would have preferred among them all, and would have married, was no longer living. This was Prince Alphonse Pignatelli, who had died of a malady of the chest. Before his death he had wished to marry Fanny so as to be able to leave her his fortune, but she had refused. As the days of the unfortunate man were numbered, she thought that it would have shown a lack of consideration on her part towards the family of Monsieur Pignatelli, if she had married him at the last moment, although she loved him dearly, and would have been happy even in losing him to bear his name. I also was grieved, for I should have preferred to have my sister called Pignatelli rather than Bertrand. Since this common name has come from my pen, this is the place to relate what had passed at the time of the last visit of my husband to Paris. The Emperor had repeatedly informed the Empress and Fanny herself of his wish that she should marry General Bertrand, his aide-de-camp who was later Grand Maréchal of the palace, who had been in love with her for a long time. My sister was not willing to consent, and the Emperor was much put out. When he learned of her preference for Alphonse Pignatelli, however, he dropped the matter. But after the death of the Prince, he took the affair up again. My husband was at Paris, just at the moment when Madame Dillon had promised a definite answer, and she requested him to see the Empress and notify her of the formal refusal of my sister. The commission was quite a delicate one. Nevertheless, he undertook it. The Empress received him in her bedroom, where the deep alcove was closed during the day by a thick drapery of heavy material, which formed a kind of wall of embroidered damask with a deep border of golden fringe. She asked him to sit down beside her on a couch which was placed against the curtain. As they were on tete-a-tete, -tete, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, without any circumlocution, acquitted himself to the Empress of the Commission with which he had been charged, while at the same time excusing himself for having brought a decision contrary to the wishes of the Emperor. As the Empress continued to insist, in the course of the conversation, which was quite long, he gave expression to very aristocratic sentiments, which were not unpleasant. Finally, after having spoken to him of himself, of me, of our children, of his fortune, of his plans, the Empress dismissed him. My husband then went to make his report to Madame Dillon regarding the interview which he had just had. That same evening, he called on Monsieur de Talleyrand, who took him by the arm, as he was in the habit of doing when he wished to talk informally with him in a corner. What possessed you, he said, to refuse General Bertrand for your sister-in-law? Was that any of your affair? Why, Fanny wished it, replied Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, and my age allows me to act for her as a father. Well, said the cunning old fox, fortunately you have not hurt your affair with all your aristocracy. They love that at the Tuileries now. Who then told you that? demanded my husband. Have you seen the Empress? Not at all, replied Talleyrand. But I have seen the Emperor, who was listening to you. It was perhaps this conversation overheard behind the curtain which made Monsieur de la Tour du Pin préfet at Brussels. It would be difficult for me to tell with exactitude the story of my sojourn at Brussels. They were very fond of society there, and they were much pleased to have at last a salon de préfet held by a woman who belonged to the aristocratic class. There were two ladies residing at Brussels who were my superiors on account of the positions occupied by their husbands. The wife of the general, commander of the division which had its headquarters at Brussels, and the wife of the first president of the imperial court, 
seated also at Brussels. The first, Madame de Chambalac, had been a beautiful Savoyard, Mademoiselle de Cousy. She was the aunt of Monsieur de Cousy, whom we have known since. It was said that she had been a religieuse or novice when her husband, during one of the campaigns in Italy, carried her off and married her. Although forty years of age, she was still quite pretty. Accustomed to live with military men of every kind, she had acquired very common manners, which, however, were relieved by a certain aristocratic gloss. You can understand that I was neither able nor willing to associate with such a person. Her antecedents repelled me. I always pictured her to myself attired in the costume of a hussar, which she had worn, it was said, in order to follow her husband during several campaigns. As for General de Chambalac, he was an imbecile who, from the very first day, took a hostile position regarding my husband, on account of jealousy. The second woman was the wife of the first president, Monsieur Betz, a learned German with much intelligence and capacity. She belonged to the lowest class in the social scale. Although she was quite homely at the age of fifty years, she might nevertheless have been pretty in her youth. She was always coiffée, parée, décolleté, like a young person. I received her at my house on state occasions, but I do not remember ever having entered her home, although I did not neglect to leave my card from time to time. The great jealousy of these two ladies was due to the fact that they were never invited to supper with the dowager. To be invited to these suppers was considered a mark of great distinction and formed the line of demarcation in the society of Brussels. The dowager was the Duchesse d'Aremberg, née Comtesse de Lamarck, and the last descendant of the boar of the Ardennes, Guillaume de Lamarck, born about 1436, who was decapitated in 1485. She represented, according to the words of the Archbishop of Manin, the ideal of the reine mère. Living in retirement in the mansion assigned to the widows of the house of Aremberg, she maintained there a simple but noble style, and invited every day to supper a certain number of persons of every age, both men and women. She always dined alone, went out in an open carriage in all kinds of weather, and saw during the course of the day her children, especially her blind son whom she tenderly loved. Every time that a slight indisposition caused by the gout prevented the latter from going out, she did not fail to go to see him. From seven to nine in the evening she received visits. After that hour, if anyone called, the Swiss demanded if he had been invited to supper. If the response was negative, he was not admitted. At this hour the guests arrived, and such was the respect in which the Duchesse was held that no one in Brussels would have ventured to arrive at half-past nine at ten o'clock, the Duchesse rang and ordered the supper served. After supper, we played at Lotto until midnight. When her son was present, he had a game of whist, or by preference a game of backgammon with Monsieur de la Tour du Pain if he was there. These reunions never comprised more than fifteen or eighteen guests, chosen from the most distinguished persons of the city, or from strangers of distinction. But the presence of strangers was rare, since France, at war with all Europe, could not be visited then as it has been since. I had often met the Duchesse d'Aremberg at Paris before the Revolution, at the Hôtel de Beauvau, where I was received with great kindness. Besides this, I knew that Madame de Poire and Madame de Beauvau had written letters regarding me prior to my arrival at Brussels. The day following our arrival, I went, therefore, accompanied by my husband, to see this distinguished lady. We were received with the greatest possible kindness and invited for supper on the following day. 
the Duchess also expressed the wish that I should present to her my son Humbert, who had come to Brussels to meet us. This was a token of the consideration with which we were to be treated. All the members of high society hastened to inscribe their names at our house or came to see us in person. I took very particular care to return all these visits without forgetting anyone. I prepared a methodical list of all the persons who had come to call. After each name, I made a note of all the particulars which I had been able to gather as to the family, either in conversation or from the nobility records which I procured at the Burgundy Library, which was and is still very rich in information of this kind. As assistance in this work, for the present time, I had Monsieur de Verseden de Varec, Secretary General of the Prefecture, and for times past, an old commander of Malta, who came to see me every evening. At the end of the month, I was as familiar with the world of Brussels as if I had lived there all my life. I knew the liaisons of every kind, the animosities, the tricasseries, and so on. Our establishment cost us a great deal of money. It seems to me that my husband received a certain sum to maintain the house, but I'm not sure of this. The personnel of the service comprised two domestics and an employé of the bureau dressed in livery, a porter, a valet de chambre, maître d'hôtel, the usher of the cabinet who also waited the days of receptions, and two men in the stable. We occupied the palace where the King of Holland has lived since. The palace at that time comprised only the east wing of the present royal palace. The west wing was then occupied by the Hôtel Bellevue. Between the two wings was the Rue Héraldique, which was closed in 1826 when the two wings were joined by the central colonnade. My private rooms on the same floor with the state apartments were pleasant and commodious. They comprised in particular a fine salon and a billiard room. From the very first I announced that I would never receive in the morning under any pretext whatsoever. The morning hours I devoted to the education of my daughters, helping them in their lessons and going out with them for promenades, either on foot or in a carriage. We soon became intimate with a number of persons. My husband met again with pleasure the Comte de Liedekerk, one of his old companions in arms before the revolution in the regiment of the Royal Comtois, of which Monsieur de la Tour du Pain had been the colonel en seconde. The Comte de Liedekerk had married Mademoiselle des Antoines, who was heiress to an immense fortune of which she already possessed a considerable part. They had only one son, Florent Charles Auguste, and two daughters. The young man, then twenty-two years of age, was auditeur of the Council of State. As there was talk of attaching one of these auditeurs to the person of each préfet, in order to give these young men an acquaintance with the administration, and with the idea of employing them as secretaries in the private cabinet of the préfet, Monsieur de Lidecaerc requested Monsieur de la Tour du Pain, his former colonel, to give his son such a post. Our son Humbert had left Antwerp, where Monsieur Malouet had been to him a second father, and returned to Brussels to take up the preparatory studies which were necessary for his examination for the Council of State, which was to take place in several months. During the month of September 1808, I received a letter from my stepmother, Madame Dillon. She informed me that my sister had finally decided, after much hesitation and uncertainty, to marry General Bertrand. She had been overcome in part by his constancy and in part by the persistency of the Emperor, to whom you could refuse nothing, as he used so much charm and fascination in obtaining what he desired. My sister at that time was extremely frivolous, with the frivolity of a creole like her mother. 
Napoleon had desired that she should accompany the Empress Josephine to Fontainebleau, and in order to enable her to appear to advantage, he had sent her 30,000 francs to cover the expenses of her wardrobe during the week that the court was to be there. At this time, he finally succeeded in obtaining her assent to the proposed union, which he had refused so obstinately. The emperor decided that the marriage should take place at once, in spite of the objection raised by my sister that her mother had just lost her daughter, poor Madame de Fitzjames. The emperor, in face of these attempts at delay, and judging that the two women, if left to themselves, would never come to a decision, said to Fanny, Have your sister come. She will arrange everything. I am leaving for Erfurt in a week. The marriage must take place before then. I was advised by a letter from the Duc de Bassano, for neither Madame Dillon nor Fanny thought to write me. Although the letter was very pleasant, it had very much the air of an order, and the thought of refusing did not enter my mind. Two hours after I received it, I was on my way to Paris. At daybreak, I arrived at the house of Madame Dinin, who was stupefied on awakening to find me beside her bed. She always kept a room at our disposal in her pretty mansion of the Rue de Merominil, where she then lived. I remained with my aunt only long enough to change my gown and to send for a carriage. Then, having taken a cup of tea, I went to see Madame Dillon, Rue Joubert, there I learned that she had been for several days in the country, not far from saint Cloud, with Madame de Boyne. She had left no word for me. I then demanded the name and the route to take to this house, and immediately set out again, after having written a line to the Duc de Bassano to announce to him my arrival. After a trip of an hour and a half, I arrived at Beauregard, the house of Madame de Boyne, above Malmaison. Half-past eleven was striking when I arrived, and Madame Dillon was still in bed. Fanny cried, Now we are saved. Here is my sister. Her mother, on the contrary, was seized with fright at the idea of the activity which my energy would impart to her. She had thought of nothing. I began by advising her to get up, dress, take breakfast, and then return to Paris with my sister and myself. At this moment, General Bertrand arrived. Until then, I had never met him, and he probably knew that my husband had been charged by Madame Dillon with the task of refusing his marriage propositions two years before. As he was naturally extremely timid, he was very much embarrassed. In order to put him at his ease, I proposed to him a walk in the park, while awaiting the moment when Madame Dillon should be dressed. During this promenade, which lasted an hour, we came to such a complete understanding that on returning to the house, all was arranged. Without entering into long details, I will say that the following morning, everything was ready and the signature of the contract was fixed for the next evening. This was accomplished at the mairie. The grand juge Regnier was awakened at five o'clock in the morning to have expedited I know not what act which had to serve as a certificate of baptism for my sister, as Madame Dillon had lost the one which she possessed, if she ever had one. Even the most diligent courier would not have been able to go to Avene in Flanders, where my sister was born, and return by the day destined by Napoleon for the marriage. The emperor had also insisted that the ceremony should take place at saint Lulieu, at the chateau of Queen Hortense. He was very careful to carry out in all particulars the orders given by the emperor for the ceremony. Thus, at the moment when he was going to assemble around him all the potentates who were then at his feet, the great man had found the time to regulate the minutest details of the celebration of the marriage of his favourite aide-de-camp. I was presented to the Emperor by Madame de Bassano at Saint-Cloud. 
towards eight o'clock in the morning it was necessary for me to go to her house in court costume with a plume toque the emperor received me in the most gracious manner asked me many questions regarding brussels the society la haute societe with a smile which seemed to say vous n'aimez que cela then he laughed at having made me get up so early in the morning and made a little fun of madame de bassano on this subject a mockery which she took with a little sulky air which was very becoming to her she has since told me that the emperor at that time was quite smitten with her the great ones of the earth arrived with their wives the clauses of the marriage contract were read but i do not remember the details although i think they were favourable to my sister fanny that day appeared to very great advantage the evening which preceded the day of the marriage passed in a very tiresome manner the dejeuner the next day was not more amusing the marriage was to take place at half past three all the ashi arrived the marshals the generals and so on we marched in a procession to the chapel the abbe dosmond bishop of nancy later archbishop of florence gave the nuptial benediction then the dinner was served and after dinner we danced many young people came from paris queen hortense who loved to dance nevertheless was in bad humour on account of a little incident which was quite amusing the emperor had not appeared but he had intimated to queen hortense that after having examined the set of emeralds surrounded by diamonds which the empress had given fanny he did not think it was sufficient as he knew that hortense had a similar set he requested her to add hers to that given by her mother in order to complete the gift she did not expect anything of this kind and was very much displeased but it was necessary to submit End of part two chapter twelve part two chapter thirteen of recollections of the revolution and the empire this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 1810 to 1811, Visit of the Emperor. I returned to Brussels after several grand dinners given in honour of the marriage, which were very boring. I set out with joy to be again with my husband and my children. The autumn and the winter passed quite agreeably at Brussels. I gave two or three handsome balls. Madame de Duras came with her daughters to pass two weeks with us. I gave them dances and took them to the theatre in the excellent box of the prefecture. They had a very good time. Queen Hortense had passed through Brussels in the course of the last journey which she made to rejoin her husband for a period of several days at Amsterdam. I saw her when she went through, and she expressed a great boredom over the necessity of going to resume her duties as queen. As I have no pretension of writing history, I will not speak of the marriage of the Emperor Napoleon with the Archduchess Marie-Louise. I will only report what my sister told me regarding the arrival of this princess at Compiègne. The Emperor was then at Compiègne with the new ladies of honour of the Empress, and was in a state of boundless impatience to see his new wife. A little caleche was waiting all hitched up in the court of the chateau to take him to meet her. When the advance courier came, Napoleon rushed to the caleche and set out to meet the Berlin which was bringing the spouse so much desired. The carriage stopped the door was opened, and Marie-Louise prepared to descend. But her husband did not give her the time. He entered the bed in, embraced his wife, and then, having pushed her sister, the Queen of Naples, without ceremony onto the front seat of the carriage, 
he seated himself beside Marie-Louise. Arriving at the chateau, he descended first, offered her his arm, and conducted her to the Salon de Service, where all the invited guests were assembled. It was already evening. The Emperor presented, one after another, all the ladies of the mansion, and then the men. This presentation over, he took the Empress by the hand and conducted her to her apartment. All of us thought that the Empress was proceeding with her toilette. We waited for an hour, and then commenced to be very anxious to have our supper. At this moment the Grand Chamberlain came to announce that their majesties had retired. The surprise was great, but no one ventured to let it be seen, and we went to supper. This marriage with an archiduchesse was celebrated at Brussels with great rejoicing. The recollections of the Austrian domination were far from being effaced. The nobility of Brussels, which until then had kept aloof from the new government, attracted now by the good administration of a préfet of the aristocratic class, found the moment favourable to lay aside its former antipathy, which had commenced to be irksome. When Monsieur de la Tour du Pin learned that the Emperor was going to bring the young Empress to the capital of the ancient possessions of her father in Belgium, he created a guard of honour to form the service at the Chateau of Laquen. This guard was composed entirely of Belgians, to the exclusion of all French. The uniform was very simple, a green coat with amaranthine breeches. It was a cavalry corps and very well mounted. My sister came to Brussels and stayed with us at the prefecture. She was present at the grand dinner which we gave in honour of this guard, at which the ladies were adorned with ribbons of the same colours as the uniform. The Emperor arrived at Laken for dinner. The next day he received the guard of honour and all the officials, the mayor, the Duc d'Ursel, presented the municipal authorities to him. In the evening there was an assembly at which I presented the ladies, nearly all of whom I knew. Marie-Louise did not address a personal word to any of them. The name of the most illustrious lady present, for example, the Duchesse d'Arenberg or the Comtesse de Merode, meant no more to her ear than that of Madame P., wife of the Receiver-General. After the assembly I had the honour of playing a game of whist with Her Majesty. The Duc d'Ursel named the cards which I must throw upon the table, and warned me when it was my turn to deal. This kind of comedy lasted half an hour. After this, the Emperor having retired, we separated, and I was charmed to return home. The following day there was to be a grand ball at the Hôtel de Ville. I was therefore somewhat put out when I was invited to dinner at La Quenne, as I did not well see how I could find a moment to change my toilette, or at least my gown, between the dinner and the ball. However, the pleasure of seeing and listening to the Emperor during a period of two hours was so great that I could not but appreciate the value of such an invitation. The Duc d'Ursel accompanied me, and as we were to go afterwards to the Hôtel de Ville to receive the Emperor, I ordered my femme de chambre to be there with another toilette already. This dinner was one of the events of my life of which I have preserved the most agreeable recollection. Here is the way in which the guests, to the number of eight, were placed at the table. The Emperor, at his right, the Queen of Westphalia, then Maréchal Bertier, the King of Westphalia, the Empress, the Duc d'Ursel, Madame de Bouillet, finally myself at the left of the Emperor. He talked to me nearly all the time, regarding the manufactures, the laces, the daily wages, the life of the lace-makers, then of the monuments, the antiquities, 
the establishments of charity, the manners of the people, the Beguines. Fortunately, I was well posted regarding all of these subjects. The Emperor demanded of the Duc d'Ursel, What are the wages of a lace maker? The poor man was embarrassed in the endeavour to express the sum in centimes. The Emperor saw his hesitation and, turning to me, asked, What is the name of the money of the country? I replied, An escalin, or sixty three centimes. Ah, c'est bien said he we did not remain more than three quarters of an hour at table on returning to the salon the emperor took a large cup of coffee and began again to talk first he spoke of the toilette of the empress which he admired then changing the topic he asked me if i found my lodging satisfactory pas mal i replied dans l'appartement de votre majesté Ah, vraiment, said he, il a coûté assez cher pour cela. C'est ce coquin de, le nom m'échappe, le secrétaire de Monsieur Pontécoulon qui l'a fait arranger. The emperor then turned to an entirely different subject of conversation. He spoke of Charles the Bold, Duc de Bourgogne, and of Louis XI, from whom he descended quite abruptly to Louis the Fourteenth saying that he had never been really great except in his latter years. Observing with what interest I listened to him and that I understood him, he returned to Louis XI and expressed himself thus, J'ai mon avis sur celui-là, et je sais bien que ce n'est pas l'avis de tout le monde. After several words regarding the shame of the reign of Louis XV, he pronounced the name of Louis the Sixteenth, upon which, stopping with an air at once respectful and sad, he said, Ce malheureux prince. At this moment, someone announced that it was necessary to set out for the ball. Monsieur Dursel and I rushed to the carriage, and the horses at a gallop brought us to the Hotel de Ville. I went up four steps at a time. A toilette which was already awaited me. I changed my costume and was able to be in the ballroom when the emperor arrived. He paid me a compliment on my promptitude and asked me if I intended to dance. I replied, no, because I am forty years old. At this he began to laugh, saying, there are many others who dance who do not reveal their age like that. The ball was very fine and was prolonged after the supper, where everybody drank to the health of the Empress. The Emperor and his wife left the following morning. A yacht, highly decorated, took them to the end of the Canal of Brussels, where they found the carriages which conveyed them to Antwerp. On boarding the yacht, my husband noticed the Marquis de Trasigny, the commander of the Guard of Honour. Fearing that the Emperor would not invite him to take a place on the yacht, where there was only room for a few persons, he named him, at the same time adding, his ancestor was constable under St. Louis. These words produced a magic effect on the Emperor, who immediately summoned the Marquis de Trasigny and had a long talk with him. A short time later, his wife was named Dame du Palais, she pretended to be displeased over this nomination, although secretly she was delighted. After this trip of the Emperor, we resumed the ordinary train of our life at Brussels. The summer passed in visiting different country houses where we were invited to dine. We went to Antwerp to be present at the launching of a large vessel of 74, one of the new ones at that moment on the slipways. Our excellent friend Monsieur Malloway was at the head of this work through his position as préfet maritime. All the details of these constructions interested me in the highest degree. Our son Humbert went to Paris to pass his examination. It was a very trying thing for a young man of twenty years to reply to a whole series of questions which were asked him. 
but it was even more so when the emperor, seated in an armchair with the candidate standing before him, took up the examination and asked you a lot of unexpected things. Humbert heard the examiner say in the year of Napoleon, in pointing him out, this is one of the most distinguished. And this good word comforted him. The emperor asked him if he knew any foreign language, to which he replied, English and Italian, as well as French. It was the facility with which he spoke Italian that decided his nomination as sous-prefet at Florence. Towards the end of the winter of 1810 and 1811, we went, my husband and I, to pass two months at Paris to accompany our son Humbert, who was setting out for Florence. My sister Fanny was at Paris with her two children, of whom the younger, little Hortense, was only three months old. We had left at Brussels Madame Denine, my two daughters, and Monsieur Lally, who passed for an English prisoner. He was very anxious not to lose this position in order to preserve the pension of three hundred pounds sterling which was paid him on that account by the English government. My dear Humbert left for Florence. This departure, the beginning of a long absence, was very painful to me. I was his friend as well as his mother. I was therefore desirous of returning at once to Brussels, but my husband did not think it advisable to leave Paris before the birth of the imperial child, which was expected at any moment. One evening I was invited to an entertainment given at the Tuileries in a little gallery, where a theatre had been improvised. We assembled in the salon of the Empress. The Emperor came directly to me. With an extreme kindness, he spoke to me first of my son. Then he exclaimed regarding the simplicity of my dress, my good taste and my distinguished air, to the great surprise of several ladies covered with diamonds, who were asking each other who this newcomer could possibly be. When we entered the gallery, I was placed upon a bench very near that of the Emperor. The play L'Avocat Patelin was performed by some admirable actors. The piece, which was very comical, amused Napoleon very much, and he laughed heartily. The presence of the great man did not prevent me from doing the same. This pleased him very much, as he said afterwards, in mocking the ladies who thought it necessary to maintain their gravity. It was considered a great favour to be invited to this spectacle, and only about fifty ladies were present. The morning of the 20th of March, 1811, we heard the first discharge of the guns of the Invalide. Everyone rushed into the street. All the carriages stopped. The merchants upon the thresholds of their shops, the people at their windows, counted the strokes. We heard everyone say, three, four, five, and so on. There was an interval of about a minute between each discharge. After the 21st, there was a profound silence. But at the 22nd, there were spontaneous cries of Vive l'Empereur. That evening, I dined with my sister, Madame Bertrand, and there we were notified that the child would be privately baptised at nine o'clock, and that the ladies who had been presented at court could attend the ceremony. Madame Dillon, my sister and I, went. We had to enter by the Pavillon de Flore, and pass through all the apartments as far as the Salle des Maréchaux. The salons were full of the dignitaries of the Empire, men and women. Everyone endeavoured to be at the edge of the passageway kept open by the ushers, where the procession was to pass to descend to the chapel. We managed to manoeuvre so as to find ourselves on the landing of the stairway. From this point we enjoyed a very rare sight, of the old grognard of the Vieille Garde, 
arranged in order upon each step, every one wearing the cross upon his breast. They were forbidden to make a movement, but a very vivid emotion was depicted upon their stern faces, and I saw tears of joy in their eyes. The Emperor appeared at the sight of Madame de Montesquieu, who bore the child with his face uncovered upon a cushion of white satin covered with lace. I had the opportunity to obtain a good look at him. End of Part 2, Chapter 13「two, chapter fourteen of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter fourteen, eighteen eleven to eighteen thirteen, an audience with Napoleon. A few days later, we returned to Brussels, where the Emperor was expected during the spring. His brother Louis had deserted the throne of Holland where the iron hand of Napoleon had prevented him from carrying out his policy for the good of the country. He had left in Holland a very honourable record, as I know from King William himself. The people felt very differently about the administration of Monsieur de Selle, the son-in-law of Madame de Valence, whose memory there has been held in horror. The Emperor appointed him préfet at Amsterdam, where he did all the evil of which a man is capable who is absolutely devoid of principle. It was towards the spring of this year, 1811, as nearly as I can remember, that we received the visit, always dreaded by the préfet, of a council of state en mission, a kind of spy of high rank determined to find fault even with those whom he could not help esteeming. Monsieur Réal fell to the lot of Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, who realised at the time of the first visit that he would endeavour to do him all the harm possible. Nevertheless, during his sojourn we gave him a dinner, followed by a reception. I had said to the ladies who had shown kindness to me that they would do me a favour in coming to pass the evening with us. After dinner, on returning to the Grand Salon, we found united there all the most distinguished persons of the city of Brussels, both men and women. Monsieur Réal was stupefied by the names, the manners and the jewels. He could not refrain from saying to Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, Monsieur, voilà un salon qui m'offisque terriblement. To which my husband replied, I'm very sorry, but fortunately it does not have the same effect on the Emperor. The 19th of September, 1811, the Emperor set out from Paris to visit the camp at Boulogne, the French fleet and the north of the Empire. The Empress went to Laeken, near Brussels, where she arrived the night of the 21st or 22nd of September. We were invited to come to Laken every day to pass the evening and to play at Lotto. This lasted for a week and was very boring. The Empress on every occasion showed the greatest insipidness. Every day she said the same thing to me in giving me her pulse to count. Do you think that I have any fever? To which I invariably replied, Madame, I do not know anything about it. The Duc de Selle was charged with the task of arranging the morning promenades according to the weather. One day when Marie-Louise visited the museum, she seemed to be struck by a handsome portrait of her illustrious grandmother, Marie-Thérèse. The Duc d'Orsel proposed to her to place the portrait in a salon at Laeken. She replied, Oh no, the frame is too old. Another time he suggested, as an interesting promenade, that part of the forest of Soigne known as the pilgrimage of the Archiduchesse Isabel, whose sanctity and goodness have remained in the hearts of the people. She replied that she did not like the woods. In fine, this insignificant woman, so unworthy of the great man whose destiny she shared, seemed to make it a point 
to be as disagreeable as possible to the Belgians, whose hearts were so disposed to love her. I never saw her again until after she lost her throne, and then she was still as destitute of intelligence. During the summer of 1811, Monsieur de Talleyrand came to preside over an electoral college, summoned, I think, to elect a senator and two deputies to the corps législatif. He arrived with a large household and gave several dinners in the fine apartments of the Hotel d'Arenberg, placed at his disposal by the blind duke. On this occasion, he showed again all his great and charming manners, which contrasted in a comical fashion with those of the Archbishop of Malines, who had the appearance of a scapin in a violet cassock. About the middle of the spring of 1812, we began to see troops passing through on their way to Germany. Several regiments of the Young Guard came to Brussels and remained there. Other regiments only passed through the city. Instructions were received to bring together the farmers' wagons hitched to four horses. Sometimes the order was received only in the morning, and it was necessary the same evening to have eighty or one hundred wagons assembled, provided with forage for two days. The gendarmes had to gallop in every direction to notify the farmers. The latter, obliged to leave their ploughs and their work, were in very bad humour. But who would have dared to resist? The thought never occurred to anyone from Bayonne to Hamburg. We served several substantial meals to the corps of officers, who came at ten o'clock in the evening and left at midnight. Doubtless very few of these brave fellows ever returned from this disastrous campaign. No one had any idea that a French army would go as far as Moscow. Therefore, when my husband, upon his return from a trip of several days to Paris, brought back a very fine map of Poland and Russia, we were astonished that La Pie had added upon the margin a little square of paper on which was the name of Moscow. The map did not go as far as the meridian of that city, and when pinned to the draperies of the salon, everyone thought that this precaution on the part of the map-maker was very unnecessary. It was a prognostic. During the last months of this same year, young Auguste de Lidecac Beaufort paid very marked attentions to my elder daughter Charlotte, who at this time was sixteen years of age. She was very tall and, without being pretty, had a very distinguished air. She was a noble demoiselle in every sense of the term. In this affair, both the heart and mind of young Lidecoeur were involved. He felt that Mademoiselle de la Tour du Pin, with her personal charms, her name and her connections, although without fortune, suited him better than some good Belgian girl who was very rich and very obscure. He declared to his parents that he would not marry any other woman than my daughter. His father raised some objections, but his mother, in the hope that the political career of her son would be favoured by a marriage which would take him out of his country, obtained the consent of her husband. The first day of the year 1813, at ten o'clock in the morning, Madame de Lidecoeur was announced. She demanded the hand of my daughter for her son. I was prepared for this request, which I received and agreed to with pleasure. Madame de Lidecoeur wished to see my daughter, whom she embraced, and it was arranged that the marriage should take place within six weeks. My daughter Cécile was at the convent of the Dame de Berlemont, where she had been for six months preparing for her first communion. I promised to take her out the day of her sister's marriage. At the same time, we received news that Humbert, then sous-préfet at Florence, had just been named as sous-préfet at Sens, Department of the Yonne. This news filled the measure of our contentment. My husband had gone to Nivelle to be present at the drawing of the conscription, 
necessitated by the continuation of the war which the Emperor had undertaken. I was alone at home before luncheon when I saw the Secretaire General of the Prefecture enter with a dejected face. He informed me that the courier from Paris had just brought word of the dismissal of my husband and of his replacement by Monsieur de Houdreau, Préfet of Ghent. This news struck me like a thunderclap, and in it I saw, at the first moment, a cause of breaking off the marriage of my daughter. However, I made up my mind not to yield without a fight. Without awaiting the return of my husband, to whom I had sent a courier, I decided to leave at once for Paris. I owe it to Monsieur de Liedekerk to state that he came to see me with an eagerness and a warmth which must surprise him now if he recalls this circumstance to beg me not to change our plans in any respect. I left my aunt and Madame de Morville to pack everything which belonged to us in the prefecture, and at four o'clock I set out for Paris. I had had so many things to do and to arrange in the space of two hours that I was already fatigued when I set out. The night passed in a wretched chaise de poste, and the anxiety caused by our new position gave me quite a high fever, with which I arrived at Paris at ten o'clock in the evening. I went to the house of Madame de Duras, whom I found out. Her daughters had just gone to bed. They arose and sent someone in search of their mother, who, on returning, found me lying on her sofa, worn out with fatigue. There was no room in the apartment to lodge me, but she had the key of the apartment of the Chevalier de Tussy, our common friend. My femme de chambre and the servant, who had followed me, went and prepared a bed in which I took refuge at once. But without finding the repose of which I had great need. The next morning at an early hour, Madame de Duras came with Dr. Auviti, whom she had summoned. He found that I had still a good deal of fever, but I told him that it was necessary for him to get me on my feet at no matter what cost, and that I must be in a state to go to Versailles before night. He then gave me a calming draught, which caused me to sleep until five o'clock. I do not know in what state of health I then found myself, but at any rate, I did not pay any attention to it. I had a carriage called, and dressed in a very elegant toilette, I went in search of Madame de Duras. We set out at once for Versailles, where the Emperor was staying at Trianon. We stopped at an inn, Rue de l'Orangerie, where they put us together in an apartment. I at once opened my inkstand. Madame de Duras, to whom I had confided only my desire to have an audience with His Majesty, saw me take a fine large sheet of paper and then copy a rough draft which I had drawn from my portfolio and said to me, To whom are you writing? To whom? I replied. Apparently, to the Emperor. I do not like small measures. The letter written and sealed, we again got into a carriage to take it to Trianon. There I asked for the Chamberlain on duty. I had taken the precaution to prepare a little note for him. By a fortunate chance, he was Adrien de Meun, who was one of my best friends. He approached the carriage and promised me that at ten o'clock, when the Emperor came from tea with the Empress, he would hand him my letter. He kept his promise and was as satisfied as he was surprised when, on looking at the address, Napoleon said, speaking to himself, Madame de la Tour du Pin writes very well. It is not the first time that I have seen her handwriting. These words confirmed my suspicion that a certain letter written to Madame de Nîn had been seized before arriving at its destination. After our trip to Trianon, we returned to our hotel. About ten o'clock in the evening, while Claire and I were debating as to whether I would have my audience, yes or no, the hotel waiter, 
who up to that moment had considered us as simple mortals, opened the door and cried, De la part de l'empereur! The same moment, a man covered with gold lace entered and said, His Majesty awaits Madame de la Tour du Pin tomorrow at ten o'clock in the morning. The good news did not trouble my slumber. On the following morning, after having drunk a large bowl of coffee, which Claire had prepared with her own hands to brace me up, as she said, I set out for Trianon. I had to wait ten minutes in the salon which preceded the one where Napoleon received. I was very glad to find no one there, for I had need of this moment of solitude to arrange my thoughts. A conversation on tete-a-tete with this extraordinary man was an event of great importance in my life, and nevertheless I declare here in all the sincerity of my heart, perhaps with pride, that I did not feel in the least embarrassed. The door opened. The usher, by a gesture, made me a sign to enter, and then closed the double door behind me. I found myself in the presence of Napoleon. He advanced to meet me and said with quite a pleasant air, Madame, I am afraid that you are very much displeased with me. I inclined my head in sign of assent, and the conversation began. Having lost the notes which I wrote of this long audience, which lasted fifty-nine minutes by the clock, after the lapse of so many years I am not able to remember all the details of the interview, the Emperor endeavoured, in short, to prove to me that he had been forced to act as he had done. Then I pictured to him in a few words the state of the society at Brussels, the consideration which my husband had acquired there, compared with all the preceding préfets, the visit of Réal, the stupidity of General Chambelac and of his wife, a religieuse des Franquets, and so on. All this was recited rapidly, and as I was encouraged by his air of approbation, I ended by announcing to the Emperor that my daughter was going to marry one of the greatest seigneurs of Brussels, upon which he interrupted me, placing his beautiful hand upon my arm, and said, J'espère que cela ne fera pas manquer de mariage, et dans ce cas, vous ne devriez pas le regretter. Then, while promenading the length of the large salon, while I followed, walking at his side, he pronounced these words, and it is perhaps the only time in his life that he ever said them, and the privilege was reserved for me to overhear him. I have made a mistake, but what can I do? I replied, Your Majesty can repair the error. Then he placed his hand upon his forehead and said, Ha! Ah, they are at work upon the prefectures. The Minister of the Interior is coming this evening. Then he mentioned the names of four or five departments and added, There is Amiens. Will that suit you? I replied without hesitation, Perfectly, sire. In that case, it is arranged, said he. You can go and notify Montalivet. And with that charming smile of which so much has been said, après son m'avez-vous pardonné? I replied to him in my best manner, J'ai besoin aussi que votre majesté me pardonne de lui avoir parlé si librement. Oh, vous avez très bien fait. I made a courtesy, and he went to the door, which he opened for me himself. On coming out, I found Adrien de Meun and Juste Noé, who asked me if I had arranged my business. I only replied that the Emperor had been very kind to me. Without losing time, I entered my carriage, and taking Madame de Duras, who, unable to overcome her impatience, had come to await me in an allée of Trianon, we returned to Paris. After having left Madame de Dura at her door, I went to see Monsieur de Montalivet, where I arrived at about 2.30 o'clock. He received me in a friendly manner, but with a very sad air, saying, Ah, oh, I could do nothing to prevent it. The Emperor is very displeased with your husband. 
They have told him a thousand tales. They pretend that people went to your house as to a court. With the idea of amusing myself a little with him, I replied, But would it not be possible to find another place for my husband? Oh, I would never dare to propose such a thing to the Emperor. When he is put out, justly or unjustly, with anyone, it is very difficult to change him. Well, I replied with a hypocritical air, it is necessary to bow the head. However, as you were going to Trianon to present four nominations for prefets to be signed, but how do you know that? he cried hastily. Without having the appearance of understanding, I added, you will propose Monsieur de la Tour du Pain for the prefecture of Amiens. He looked at me with stupefaction, and I continued very simply, the Emperor has charged me to tell you that. Monsieur de Montalivet gave an exclamation, took my hands with much friendship and interest, and at the same time looking at me from head to foot. Indeed, he said, I should have divined that that pretty toilette this morning was not intended for me. The nomination of Monsieur de la Tour du Pain appeared the same evening in the Moniteur, and I received the compliments of all the people of my acquaintance who had been afflicted by the news of his disgrace. In fact, this dismissal was a fortunate event for my husband, as you will see later on. I remained several days at Paris, where I awaited my husband and the Comte de Liedekerk, who came to rejoin me for the signature of the contract of marriage. At this time, there was an assembly at court, and I went with Madame de Meun. I was dressed very simply, without a single gem, contrary to the custom of the ladies of the empire who were covered with jewels. I found myself placed in the last row in the throne room, where I was a head taller than two little women who had placed themselves unceremoniously before me. The emperor entered. He glanced his eyes over the three rows of ladies, spoke to several with an inattentive air, and then, having perceived me, he smiled in that manner which all the historians have endeavoured to describe, and which was truly remarkable, from the contrast it presented to the usual expression of his face, which was always serious and often severe. But the surprise of my neighbours was great when Napoleon, still smiling, addressed to me these words, Et vous content de moi, madame? The persons who surrounded me then withdrew to the right and left, and I found myself, without knowing how, in the front rank. I thanked the emperor in an accent of very sincere gratitude. After several very amiable words, he passed on. This was the last time I saw this great man. I set out for Brussels. I was very desirous of seeing my children, and where I had besides a thousand things to do. My husband went by way of Amiens to prepare for our installation. He then came to rejoin me with Humbert, who was back from Florence and who had received at Paris his nomination as sous préfet de Sens. Who could have possibly foreseen at that moment that ten months later? He would be chased from that city by the Württembergers. When Monsieur de la Tour du Pin arrived at Brussels, he found me settled with my children, with the Marquis de Trésigny, who had offered us a very cordial hospitality. Monsieur Dutot had announced, without delicacy, that he would take possession of the prefecture the second day after the date of my return to Brussels. I was desirous that he should find no vestige of our sojourn of five years in the house which he was to inhabit. Everything which belonged to us was packed and dispatched. As for the furniture of the prefecture, every article had been put back in the place designated by the infantry. Nothing was lacking. Monsieur Dutot was rather put out by this exactitude, and was even more disturbed by the regrets which all classes loudly expressed over the recall of Monsieur de la Tour du Pain. He found a pretext to return to Ghent, 
and lived there until after our departure, which was fixed for the 2nd of April. My daughter was to be married the 20th. My husband could say with Guzman, J'étais maître en ces lieux, Sir J. commande encore. He therefore summoned the chief of police, Monsieur Malaise, and enjoined him to see that there was no manifestation to pronounced on the part of the people on the occasion of the marriage of our daughter. The mayor, the Duc d'Ossel, to the same end, fixed an advance star of the evening, half past ten, for the marriage at the municipality. This did not prevent the people from assembling in crowds in all the streets through which we were to pass in going to the Hôtel de Ville, which was brilliantly illuminated. On all sides we heard only expressions of regret and kindness in connection with Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. When we returned after the civil marriage at the Hôtel de Ville to the house of Madame de Trassigny, we found all the salons of the ground floor lighted up, and in the street under the windows was a large band composed of all the musicians of the city to give us a serenade. My husband was naturally very much pleased at this manifestation of the public goodwill. The following day, my daughter was married in the private chapel of the Duc d'Ossel. After a fine déjeuner attended by relatives and friends, she left with her husband for the Chateau de Noisy, situated near Dinan in the Belgian Ardennes. There her father-in-law had preceded her by several hours. I accompanied them as far as Tillemont. Up to this moment, I have not spoken again of Monsieur de Chambeau, our friend and companion in misfortune during our emigration to America. He had fallen into possession of a small fortune and had passed at Brussels the greater part of his leisure time. His business, however, obliged him to make long sojourns in the south of France. For a year past, he had occupied at Antwerp a position which was temporary, it is true, but which held out the assurance of advancement. When he learned of the catastrophe which had forced our departure from Brussels so suddenly, he came at once, and knowing the bad state of our affairs, he said to my husband, You are about to marry your daughter, and at the same time you are losing your position. I have 60,000 francs in securities which I have brought you. Use them as your own. He was present at the marriage of Charlotte, who was his goddaughter. At the moment I write these lines at Pisa in the beginning of the year 1845, I do not know anything more about this excellent man. I saw him again ten years ago at Paris. At this time he was living in a little country house at Epigny, where he had fallen entirely under the influence of two young serving maids, who had acquired an unfortunate control over his old age. They took care to prevent him from coming near us. Our poor friend is probably no longer living. End of Part 2, Chapter 14「2 Chapter 15 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 15, 1813 to 1814 Return of the King It was in the month of April 1813 that we arrived at Amiens, where we were destined to see happen events which we were far from looking for, here we found our brother-in-law, the Marquis de la Mette, whose friendship had already assured us a very favourable reception on the part of the nobility and of the people of importance in the city, who up to then had been very much dissatisfied with their préfets. The house set apart for the préfecture was charming. It had just been entirely refurnished with elegance and luxury. The ground floor comprised a complete apartment, where I lived with my husband. On one side was the cabinet of the préfet, communicating with the bureaus. The house looked out on a magnificent garden of seven or eight acres, well cultivated. 
This gave us almost the pleasure of being in the country. The first days of summer passed very agreeably. We often went to dinner in the neighbourhood with friends who resided there during the fine season. My daughter Cecile, who was 13 years of age at this time, already showed a very great talent for music and also had a charming voice of great compass. During the five years that we had passed at Brussels, I had given her an excellent teacher in Italian. Formerly from Rome, and not knowing French, he had taught my daughter to use the fine Roman idiom. She expressed herself in this language with facility. Charlotte and she also read not only Italian, but also English. We were very well settled at Amiens when we commenced to hear the grumbling of the storm. Everyone was so confident of the fortunes of Napoleon that the idea did not occur to anyone to admit that he could possibly have any other enemy to fear than the frosts that had been so fatal to him during the Russian campaign. However, after the Battle of Leipzig, there began the requisitions the enlisting of men and the organisation of guards of honour. This last measure caused desolation among the families. Under these circumstances, my husband had need of all his firmness. He served the government in good faith, and the thought of the restoration had not yet occurred to his mind. He neither foresaw it nor desired it. All the faults and all the vices which had been the causes of the first revolution were still too fresh in his memory for him to desire to see the exiled royal family return, bringing in its train the former weakness and abuses of all kinds. The expression so well justified, they have learned nothing and forgotten nothing, often came to his mind. However, he endeavoured so far as possible to mitigate the application of the rules for the organisation of the Guard of Honour. The greatest resistance to certain measures was found among the rich classes, and I often heard him say, they give their children more willingly than their money. In a city devoted to the manufacture of woollens like Amiens, the requisitions were very burdensome, and my husband suspected above all things the greediness and the rascality of the requisitionnaires. The cannon of Long, which we heard at Amiens, gave us the first news of the invasion of French territory. Several days later, Monsieur Duto, the préfet of Brussels, fleeing before the invasion, entered our salon one evening, at the very moment that the receiver-general, Monsieur Dobiser, who saw everything in a rosy light, was saying to us that he had just received a letter from Brussels and that Belgium was in no danger of a coup de main. Soon afterwards we were informed of the appearance of a corps of Cossacks commanded by General Geismar in the plains around the city. It was at this time that General Dupont passed through Amiens under the escort of the gendarmes. He had previously been transferred from the Chateau of Joux when Napoleon had had him confined, after the capitulation of Bailen, to the citadel of Doulon. They were now conducting him to Tours, in order that he might not fall into the hands of the Allies. He did not go any further than Paris, however, and the severity with which he was treated made his fortune. The Cossacks approached so near to Amiens that they could be seen from the tower of the cathedral. The squadron of cavalry in garrison in the city, commanded by our worthy major, presented such a formidable appearance that they did not appear again. My aunt, Madame Denin, was settled for the autumn at the Chateau of Mouchy, near Beauvais, with her friend, the Princesse de Poix. Madame de Dura was also there with her daughters, and they invited me to come and pass several days. My husband urged me to accept, and asked me to return by way of Paris, to see Monsieur de Talleyrand and ascertain the news. Monsieur de Talleyrand 
had sent him a note by Merlin de Thionville, but this note was so nonsensical, and the reputation of the bearer was so bad, that my husband, averse to all intrigue, was afraid of being drawn, in spite of himself, into some adventure of Monsieur de Talon, who hesitated at nothing and who willingly pushed other people forward, while quite ready to abandon them later on to save himself. I accordingly set out for Mushi, where I remained three days. I left in the morning after breakfast to return to Amiens by way of Paris. Not wishing to pass the night there, I stopped at the apartment of Monsieur de Lally, who was at Mushi. After the time necessary to make a slight change in my toilette, I went to see Monsieur de Talleyrand, whom I found alone in his room. He received me as always with that familiar grace which he has ever shown towards me. People have said many hard things of him, and perhaps he has merited even worse, so that the expression of Montesquieu regarding Caesar could well be applied to him. Mais cet homme extraordinaire avait tant de grandes qualités sont pas un défaut, quoi qu'il ait bien des vices. Well, in spite of everything, he possessed a charm which I have never found in any other man. It was all very well to be armed at all points against his immorality, his conduct, his life, against everything with which he was reproached. Nevertheless, he attracted you as a bird is fascinated by the eye of the serpent. There was nothing particularly remarkable about our conversation that day. I noticed only that he repeated with a certain affectation that Monsieur de la Touripin was well, very well, to be at Amiens. I informed him of my intention to leave in the morning. He told me not to do so. The Emperor was expected in the course of the next day. He would see him and would come to find me after his interview and would let me know at what hour I could command my post-horses which would certainly not be before ten o'clock in the evening. I returned home very much put out of being kept another twenty-four hours in Paris. After having written my husband to notify him of this delay, I endeavoured to occupy the morning of the day following in going to breakfast with my good friend Madame de Morville, and in making several calls. At ten o'clock, my horses were attached and waiting at the door, the postillion was beginning to get impatient as well as I myself when Monsieur de Talleyrand arrived. What folly to set out in this cold, he said, but above all things in a calèche. But whose apartment is this? That of Monsieur de Lally. Then, taking a candle from the table, he began to look at the engravings which were hung in fine frames around the room. Ah! Charles the second, James the second, just so. And he put the candle back on the table. Mon Dieu, I cried, il est bien question de Charles the second, de James the second. Vous avez vu l'empereur? Comment est-il? Que fait-il? Que dit-il après une défaite? Oh, laissez-moi donc tranquille avec votre empereur. C'est un homme fini. Comment fini? I said. Que voulez-vous dire? Je veux dire, he replied, que c'est un homme qui se cachera sous son lit. This expression at the moment did not surprise me so much as at the end of our conversation. I indeed knew the hatred and rancour of Monsieur de Talleyrand towards Napoleon but never had I heard him express himself with so much bitterness. I asked him a thousand questions, to which he replied only by the words, Il a perdu tout son matériel. Il est à bout. Voilà tout. Then, searching in his pocket, he brought out a paper printed in English, and while putting two logs on the fire, he added, Let us burn a little more of the wood of poor Lally. Since you know English, read this passage for me. At the same time, he indicated quite a long article marked with a pencil on the margin. 
I took the paper and read. Dinner given by the Prince Regent to Madame la Duchesse d'Angouleme. I stopped and raised my eyes to his. He had his usual impassable countenance. Go on and read. Your postillion is getting impatient. I resumed my reading. The article gave a description of the dining room, hung in sky-blue satin with bouquets of lilies. The top of the table, entirely decorated with this same royal flower, with the service of Sèvres, showing views of Paris and so on. Arrived at the end, I stopped and looked at him like one stupefied. He took the paper back, folded it slowly, put it back in his vast pocket and said, with that sly and malicious smile which he alone possessed, Ah, que vous êtes bête! À présent, partez, mais ne vous en rumez pas. Then, ringing, he said to my valet de chambre, Call the carriage for madame. He then left me, crying out as he put on his mantle, Give my best regards to Gouvernet. I send him that for his breakfast. You will arrive in time. I reached Amiens at so early an hour that my husband had not yet risen. Without losing a moment, I related to him the above conversation, which had worried me during the night to such a degree that I could not sleep. In it, he saw the explanation of certain perplexing expressions of Merlin de Thionville, and he enjoined me to guard as the most absolute secret what I had learned. For if it was by such means, he said, that the Bourbons thought that they could mount the throne, they would not remain there long. A little later, my husband ordered Umber to leave for Paris to secure further news. My son had been at Amiens for two weeks. Driven from his sous-prefecture by the Württembergers, he had taken refuge with us in order to care for his health, which had been compromised by an attack of pleurisy which he contracted at Sons, and of which he had been very ill when the enemy approached that city. Humbert arrived at the residence of Monsieur de Talleyrand at Paris at the very moment that the latter was receiving as his guest the Emperor Alexander. He passed the night on a bench which Monsieur de Talleyrand had assigned to him, in enjoining him not to move, so that he could find him at hand when he thought that the time had come for him to return to Amiens. At six o'clock in the morning, Monsieur de Talleyrand tapped him on the shoulder. Ambert saw that he was fully dressed. Leave, he said, with a white cockade, and cry, Vive le roi! Humber was not sure that he was entirely awake. Shaking himself, he set out nevertheless and arrived at Amiens where the news of the events had already been received, and where Monsieur de la Tour du Pain was not entirely sure what position he was going to take. But the voice of the people was not long in making itself heard. The requisitions, the guards of honour and so on, had exasperated all classes of society. In an instant, as by an electric movement, Cries of Vive le Roi issued from all mouths. People rushed to the court of the prefecture to demand white cockades, with which Umbert on leaving Paris had filled the coffers of his calèche. The supply was soon exhausted. During the day, when the news of the arrival of Louis the Eighteenth became known, people began to pay us marked attention. Several days after, when they learned that the préfet had left for Boulogne to await the arrival of the king, and that his majesty would stop at Amiens, and that he would pass the night at the prefecture, a large number of people came to offer me articles of every nature which could be used to ornament or embellish the house, such as clocks, vases, pictures, flowers, and so on. Monsieur de Durat, having been designated to take up his service with the king as gentlemen of the chamber, had passed through the city to go and await the King of Boulogne. In spite of so many changes, he had preserved all the prejudices, all the hatred, all the littleness, all the rancours of other days, as if there had never been a revolution. Monsieur de Poix had also taken the road for Boulogne, but he stopped at Amiens. 
very much disturbed as to the reception which he might receive from the king on account of his son who was chamberlain of the emperor and of his daughter-in-law who had been lady of the palace of the empress but i had no time to raise his courage and i confided to my daughter charlotte the task of talking with him while i superintended the arrangement of the table of twenty-five covers which the king was to honour with his presence i was in the dining-room when a gentleman entered and said several words to my servant in a tone which displeased me approaching him i demanded unceremoniously why he was interfering he endeavoured to make an impression on me by saying that he belonged to the suite of the king his surprise was very great when he learned that i was determined to remain mistress of my house and that i was little disposed to let him give orders there he went away grumbling it was monsieur de blacas a word from my husband had told me that the king had received him with much kindness and that he was quartered at the prefecture with the duchesse d'angouleme all was ready at the appointed hour twelve young ladies of the city at the head of whom was my daughter cecile were waiting to present their bouquets to madame the carriage in which were the king and madame was drawn by the company of millers of amiens who had demanded this ancient privilege these were the fellows to the number of fifty or sixty all attired at their own expense in new costumes of grey white cloth with large hats of white felt then drew the royal carriage to the cathedral where the bishop intoned the te deum the doors of the church had been kept closed and were not opened until the moment when the king was seated in his armchair at the foot of the altar then in less than a moment this immense church was filled to such a point that there was not room for another person in thinking at this writing of the innumerable stupidities which later precipitated his brother charles the tenth from the throne i have almost a feeling of shame at the recollection of the emotion which i felt on seeing this old man thanking god for having replaced him upon the throne of his fathers madame knelt at the foot of the altar in tears and my heart shared the sentiments which she felt alas this solution did not endure for twenty-four hours the flower dealers then conducted the king to the prefecture where he received the whole city men and women before dinner with that grace with that presence of mind with that charm which eminently distinguished him at seven o'clock we sat down at the table the dinner was excellent the wines perfect which particularly pleased the king and which brought me many kind compliments it was then for the first time that this simple provincial gentleman monsieur de blacas who had thought that he could issue his commands discovered that in the wife of the prefet he had to deal with a former lady of honour he was very much confused by his mistake and paid me a thousand compliments in the endeavour to make me forget his first attitude but without success my cousin edward jerningham and his charming wife had accompanied the king from england to france and his majesty stated with much kindness that edward had been of great service to his cause in the english journals by the articles which he had written which had had a very great success both edward and his wife suggested that the extremely english costume of madame would displease the court of napoleon which was united at compiegne to await the new sovereign both of them represented the necessity of not alienating sympathy at the very beginning at their suggestion i spoke of the matter to mademoiselle de choisy lady of honour to madame and to monsieur de blacas who spoke about it to the king but nothing could overcome the obstinacy of this princess. My son-in-law had ceased to be a Frenchman, and had now become a subject of the new king of the Low Countries, William I, who was the same Prince d'Orange whom I had seen in England under very different circumstances. 
he returned with my daughter to Brussels to his family, and this separation was very grievous to me. I went back to Paris, and we established ourselves, my husband and I, in a pretty apartment, 6 Rue de Varenne, where my son Humbert was also located. The very evening of my arrival, I went with Madame de Dura to a fete which was given by Prince Schwarzenberg, Generalissimo of the Austrian troops. There I saw all the conquerors, and was witness of all the baseness with which they were surrounded, and, so to speak, overwhelmed. What a curious spectacle for a philosophical mind! Everything recalled Napoleon, the furniture, the supper, the guests. The thought came to me that among all those who were united there, there were some who had trembled before the Emperor when he had vanquished them, and others who had formerly solicited his favour or even his smile, and that there was not one present who seemed worthy to be his conqueror. Certainly the situation was interesting, although profoundly sad. Madame de Dura saw in it only the happiness of being the wife of the first gentleman of the king's chamber. The fall of the great man, the invasion of her country, the humiliation of being the host of the conquerors, did not appear to trouble her. As for myself, I had a feeling of shame which was probably not shared by anyone else. Monsieur de la Tour du Pain foresaw that the administrative career, although suited to his taste, would fall into a class inferior to that in which he had a right to be placed. He therefore desired to resume his rank in the diplomatic service, where he had been before the revolution. Monsieur de Talleyrand, Minister of Foreign Affairs, proposed to him the embassy to The Hague. The new King of Holland desired it, and my husband willingly accepted this post, although he could have aspired to a higher mission. But a word from Monsieur de Talleyrand telling him to accept it gave him to understand that he was destined for other employment. My son Humbert was led away, alas, by the charm of entering the military household of the king. General Dupont, the minister of war, was a former aide-de-camp of my father and professed for me a great attachment. Humbert, who was desirous of being married, preferred to remain at Paris rather than to go elsewhere to be prefet in some little city at a distance. He was appointed Lieutenant of the Black Musketeers, a name which came from the colour of their horses. They gave him the grade of Chef d'Escadron in the army. End of Part 2, Chapter 15《パート2 Chapter 16 of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 16, 1814 to 1815, the First Restoration. At the time it was decided to hold the Congress of Vienna, I happened to be one morning in the cabinet of Monsieur de Talleyrand. My husband had gone to Brussels to be present at the coronation of the new King William the First and to deliver his credentials. He was to return in a day or two. I was preparing to leave the cabinet of the Minister of Foreign Affairs and had already placed my hand on the handle of the door to open it when, looking at Monsieur de Talleyrand, I saw upon his face that expression with which I was familiar, when he wished to do someone a good turn in his line. When is Gouvernet coming back? he said. Why, tomorrow, I replied. Well, said he, hasten his return, because he must set out for Vienna. For Vienna? I exclaimed, and why? You understand nothing. He is going as minister to Vienna, while waiting for the Congress to open, when he will be one of the ambassadors. I made another exclamation, and he continued, It is a secret. Do not speak of it to anyone, and send your husband to me as soon as he arrives. I waited impatiently, keeping the secret of the good news except from my son Humbert. This nomination aroused a great deal of envious feeling towards my husband. 
Madame de Duras was wild. She would like to have seen Monsieur de Chateaubriand obtain the post. Adrien de Laval was not even able to console himself with the promise of the embassy to Spain. Everyone cried out that it was an abuse, because my husband had also kept his place at The Hague. We decided in the family, though with great regret on my part, that Monsieur de la Tour du Pin should leave alone for Vienna, and that I should remain at Paris to occupy myself with the marriage of Humbert. My husband wrote to Auguste, our son-in-law, who was desirous of entering the diplomatic career in his country, and invited him to come to Vienna, either as his private secretary or simply as a looker-on, since, having become a subject of the Low Countries, he was no longer French. We thought that if Monsieur de la Tour du Pin remained at Vienna after the Congress, we would have no difficulty in obtaining from the King of Holland a position for Auguste as attaché at the Vienna legation. These projects, like many others, were upset by events, both public and private. It was arranged that I should accompany my husband as far as Brussels. There he would be joined by his son-in-law, and I would take my daughter and her child back to Paris with me. This plan was carried out. Our trip to Brussels and back passed very agreeably, although I felt very sad and disappointed at not accompanying my husband to Vienna. There was no reason then to suppose that his absence would be prolonged, as it was in reality. Besides, the assurance had been given me that two special couriers would set out every week from the foreign affairs, which permitted me to hope that I would receive regularly news as fresh as possible from my husband. On our return to Paris, we found news from our travellers. I settled in my apartment, and Charlotte took possession of the rooms previously occupied by her father. General Dupont, who was still very devoted to my interests, arranged to have the cross of the Legion of Honour given to Auguste, as a reward for his excellent services as sous-préfet Amiens at the moment of the Restoration. I sent it to him at Vienna, and it gave him great pleasure. My poor Charlotte had the misfortune at this time to lose her little girl, who was carried off in the short space of two days. The next day, Monsieur Liedekerk arrived unexpectedly from Vienna, charged with dispatches. It was necessary for him to set out on his return the following day. The despair of Charlotte over the loss of her child suggested to me the thought of sending her to Vienna with her husband. As her father loved her tenderly, her presence there would be a great pleasure for him also. I possessed an excellent travelling calèche. I took charge of the purchase and packing in all details of the elegant toilettes to be worn by my daughter at the fates of the coming congress. Besides, I placed at her disposal my maid, who was a very experienced person. Thanks to my usual activity, the resolution once made, the second day following my daughter was ready to set out. She left for Vienna with her husband, who was carrying dispatches from Monsieur de Talleyrand, who had not yet left Paris. I remained alone with Cécile, then fifteen years of age, and my two sons, Humbert and Aymar. It may be interesting to state how I passed my time after this restoration of the monarchy. I went to the Tuileries when the king received the ladies about once or twice a week, as a former Dame de Palais of the Queen, I had the honours. That is to say, instead of mingling with the crowd of ladies who were assembled in the first salon, called Diane, while waiting for the king to be rolled into the throne room, for he was not able to walk, I took my place immediately, as well as the other women who enjoyed the same privilege, on the benches which were arranged around the throne room. There we found many gentlemen who had also the entrees, and seated very comfortably, we talked until the moment when the king was announced, when we rose and took a more conventional and respectful attitude. 
Then we filed one by one before the royal armchair. The king always had something droll or kind to say to me. This same winter, the Duc de Berry gave two balls, to which he invited all the principal members of the Bonaparte party, the Duchesses de Rovigo, de Bassano, and so on. None of them danced, and all had a very disagreeable air, in spite of the advances and the attentions of the prince and his aides de camp. Madame de Dura and I took to one of these balls Albertine de Stahl. After having obtained the consent of her mother, who, in spite of her fifty years, was always dressed herself like a tightrope dancer, we had been permitted to dress her to our taste. Everyone found her so changed and so improved that, from that time on, she abandoned her former costume of wearing English dresses. The Duc de Bois fell in love with her, and if I am not mistaken, it was at one of these balls that he decided to demand her hand in marriage. Since I have named Madame de Stahl, this is the moment to say that shortly after my return to Paris after the Restoration, I had renewed my former acquaintance with her. I had already seen her nevertheless in 1800, when I arrived from England, a little before the time when Napoleon obliged her to leave Paris and had also met her at different periods since then. At the time of the 18 Fructidor, she had shown herself very revolutionary, carried away by her intimate relations with Benjamin Constant. Her last transformation had been accomplished in England, whence she returned a royalist. She received at her house all the notable personages from all the countries of Europe who were present in Paris during the winter of 1814 and 1815. I happened to be in her salon the evening of the day when the Duke of Wellington arrived in Paris. One hundred other persons equally curious to see this personage, already well known, were also there. My relations with the Duke went back to my childhood. Our ages were about the same, and Lady Mornington, his mother, had been closely associated with my grandmother, Madame de Rotte. Young Arthur Wellesley, his sister Lady Anne, and I had passed many evenings together. Later I again met Lady Anne in England at Hampton Court, when I went to see the old stadtholder, the Prince d'Orange. I was received by the Duke as an old friend. In this salon, where all eyes were fixed upon him, but where he knew hardly anyone, he was very glad to find someone to talk with him. During the sojourn that the Duke made at Paris before going to the Congress of Vienna, I met him almost every day. I presented my son Umber to him, and he showed him much kindness. Umber spoke English perfectly, as he had become familiar with this language both in America and in England. He had also a good acquaintance with Italian. This winter, when Paris was full of strangers, he was frequently taken for either an Englishman or an Italian. On leaving Paris, the Duke of Wellington set out for the Congress, where Monsieur de Talleyrand was already present. One evening, during the first days of March, I was in the apartment of Madame de Ducha at the Tuileries. There were many people there, including General de Lolois and his wife. Madame de Lolois appeared to fear something and showed a great desire to leave, especially when Monsieur de Duras passed through the salon after the king had retired. She rose and left the room, taking her husband with her. I remained behind and waited for Madame de Duras to return from the room of her husband, where she had followed him. I saw that she was very much troubled, and she said to me, Something terrible has happened, but Amede is not willing to explain. I then returned home, accompanied by Umber, and we made all the conjectures possible, except the right one. The following morning, the news of the debarkation of Napoleon at the Gulf of Juan spread through Paris. The news was brought by Lord Lucan. 
Having left the evening before for Italy, at several stages from Paris, he met the courier who was coming from Lyon with the news. He immediately turned around and came back to Paris, where he spread the news. The results of this event belong to the domain of history. I will therefore only recount those which concern me personally. I was too well acquainted on the one hand with the court, and on the other with the strength of the Napoleonic party, to have for a moment any doubts regarding the efficacy of the measures which would be adopted. Monsieur de la Tour du Pain, although one of the four ambassadors of France at the Congress of Vienna, and employed per interim in the diplomatic affairs of France in Austria, had nevertheless retained his post of French minister to Holland. I felt that I could not remain at Paris when Napoleon was about to arrive there, and that I ought to go to Brussels or The Hague. My plans were submitted to the King by Monsieur de Jaucourt, Minister of Foreign Affairs per interim. He approved of my purpose, and I therefore prepared to leave. Umber, as soon as the departure of the King was decided upon, was not able to leave the quarters of the Musketeers. Consequently, I was obliged to complete alone all the arrangements for my trip, which I was about to undertake with my daughter Cécile, sixteen years of age, and my son Emma, who was eight. In the evening, I went to the Bureau of the Minister of Finance to obtain the amount of the salary due Monsieur de la Tour du Pain, which I wished to take with me. The same evening, 19th of March, 1815, the King was to leave at midnight. On entering the cabinet of the minister, Monsieur Louis, with whom I had been well acquainted for a long time, I found him in a state of terrible rage, showing me a hundred little barrels, similar to those in which anchovies are sold. He said, Look, I have had these barrels prepared, each of which contains 10,000 or 15,000 francs in gold. I wish to confide one to each of the bodyguard ordered to accompany the king. And these gentlemen refused to take charge of them, under the pretext that it was not part of their duty. While saying these words, he signed my voucher for the sum which I was to receive at once. I next took the money to my man of affairs, in order to have him change it into gold. I had strongly urged Monsieur Louis to let me have one of the barrels of gold in his cabinet, but he absolutely refused. When I left my man of affairs, which was after nine o'clock, he told me to come back at eleven o'clock, and that he would then give me the gold which he had procured. I then went to see my aunt, Madame Denine, who had also decided to leave to make my adieu. I found her in company with Monsieur de Lally in a state of great trouble, packing, gesticulating, urging her fat friend, who was finishing nothing. On seeing me, she cried, But are you not going to leave, that you have such a tranquil air? I left her in the midst of her packages to go and take leave of Monsieur de Jaucourt, my minister, to have him visé my passport and obtain an order for the post horses, a very necessary thing, for it would probably have been impossible to find a single one at midnight. Finally, at exactly eleven o'clock, I returned to my man of affairs, Rue Saint Anne. He handed me twelve thousand francs in rolls of Napoleons. I had a cabriolet hired by the hour. Getting into the carriage, I said to the coachman, Home. I was living at six, Rue de Varenne. We wished to take the route by the carousel, but on account of the departure of the king, no one was allowed to pass. My coachman then kept along the Rue de Rivoli. At the moment we arrived at the Pont Louis the Sixteenth, now Pont de la Concorde, he heard the clock strike twelve. Stopping short, he declared that for nothing in the world would he go another step. His home, he said, was at Chaillot, and the gates would be closed at midnight. He demanded to be paid and invited me to continue my route on foot. I used in vain all of my eloquence and promised him a superb pourboire if he would take me only to the point where we met another hack. He refused. I was obliged to descend from the carriage, although seized with a mortal terror. 
Fortunately, at this moment, I heard the noise of a carriage. It was a hack, and vacant, thank God. I entered and offered the coachman a generous gratification to take me home. As soon as I arrived, I sent in search of the post horses. In spite of my service extraordinaire, in spite of the signature of the minister, I waited until six o'clock in the morning for two miserable horses which were to be attached to a little caleche, in which I was to take my place with Emma, Cecile and a little Belgian maid whom I had kept in my service. Our journey was not marked by any incident. We arrived safe and sound at Brussels, where I took a little lodging, Rue de Namour, with a lawyer named Monsieur Ua. He has been since, I think, Minister of Leopold I, King of the Belgians. I was very impatient to receive news from Vienna. The dispatch of the couriers who were usually sent to the foreign affairs, and by whom my husband and my daughter Charlotte wrote me, had undoubtedly been interrupted. Although I had advised them both of my departure for Brussels, I had good reason to feel that I would be a long time without news, which indeed was what happened. At Brussels I found all the persons of my acquaintance, both Belgian and French. Everyone received me cordially, with the exception of the Bonapartists. The King of Holland, William I, was at Brussels. I went to see him, and he received me cordially. We were seated upon a sofa in the former cabinet of Monsieur de la Tour du Pin. Turning to me, he said, In the salon, I try to find the inspiration to make myself loved like your husband. Alas, the poor prince did not succeed. I spoke to him urgently regarding the interests of my son-in-law, who had now become his subject. Probably it was this conversation which opened to him the diplomatic career. A little later my daughter Charlotte arrived alone from Vienna, accompanied by her maid and the valet of her father. She informed me that the Congress had dissolved at the news of the landing of Napoleon at Cannes. Everyone had left in haste, and the powers who were all ready to become enemies, had become reconciled before the imminent danger. They only thought now of making France pay dearly for the welcome given the hero, who, in making her so powerful and glorious, had raised up for her so many enemies. In the southern provinces, the Duc d'Angoulême had brought together a kind of party which might have become important under another chief. Someone was wanted to take to this prince the assurance of the union of the powers to overwhelm Napoleon. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, with his usual zeal, accepted the mission of going to Marseille to join the Duke. He set out accompanied by his son-in-law, who went as far as Genoa, whence he brought me at Brussels news from my husband. Young Liederkerk rejoined his wife in that city, and I was able to inform him on his arrival that I had assured his position with the king, his master. End of part two, chapter sixteen. Postscript of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Editor. The memoirs of Madame de la Tour du Pin were written from time to time with long interruptions. Commenced on the first day of January 1820, the last pages of the first part were not finished or put in final shape until about twenty years later. The second part was not begun until February 1843, and at the time of her death, ten years later, had been completed only to the month of March 1815. On the death of the author, the manuscript of the Journal d'une femme de cinquante ans passed into the hands of her son, Emma Marquis de la Tour du Pin, who had been born at Le Bouille, the 18th of October, 1806. On his death at Fontainebleau, the 4th of March, 1867, he left the manuscript to his nephew Adelin, Comte de Lidecac Beaufort, who himself confided it a short time before his death to one of his sons, the Colonel Comte Aymar de Lecaire Beaufort, who died in 
who published it at Paris in 1906. The book met with an immediate and well-deserved success. From the preface to the original edition by the Comte et Marie de Carc-Beaufort. With the Marquise de la Tour du Pin disappeared one of the last vestiges of the high society of the period before the revolution, of which the traditions have today completely vanished. The reader of these memoirs cannot fail to appreciate the high qualities of heart and soul and mind shown by the author. Those who knew her both esteemed and loved her. They united in saying that rarely was greater stability united to greater charms, more constant fidelity to duty to greater kindliness. Endowed with a retentive memory, which recalled in her conversation the varied recollections of so many different periods, Madame de la Tour du Pin interested to the highest degree the thoughtful and serious-minded, as she attracted to her the young, whose tastes she understood, and whose faults she excused. At the moment of the debarkation of Napoleon at the Golf Chuan, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin was at the capital of Austria, where he had been sent after the first restoration, first as minister per interim, and then as one of the plenipotentiaries of France to the Congress of Vienna. After having signed the famous declaration of the 13th of March, 1815, which placed Napoleon outside the law, he went, accompanied by Monsieur de Talleyrand, to Toulon, to endeavour to hold Maréchal Massena, governor of that place, in the service of the king, and from there to Marseille to confer with the Duc de Rivière, after this, his mission was to rejoin in the south the Duc d'Angoulême, who had received from the king the order to go to Nîmes. But having learned at Marseille the news of the surrender of this prince at Pont Saint-Esprit, after having taken, in concert with the Duc de Rivière, some indispensable measures, he chartered a vessel in order to go to Genoa, whence he expected to return to Vienna. The bad weather, or rather the ill will of the captain of this vessel, forced him to go to Barcelona. From there, by way of Madrid, he proceeded to Lisbon, where he embarked for London. During the twenty-four hours that he remained in London, he had the honour of seeing the Duchesse d'Angoulême, and put her in touch with the situation in France. The night following this interview, he left for Dover, passed over to Ostend, and went to Ghent, where he joined Louis the Eighteenth. After the Battle of Waterloo, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin returned to Paris at the same time with the King. In the month of August following, he took part in the general elections as President of the Electoral College of the Department of the Somme. The 17th of the same month, he was named Peer of France by Louis the Eighteenth. As stated in the memoirs of his wife, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, while acting as one of the plenipotentiaries of France at the Congress of Vienna, had kept the post to which he had been appointed a short time before of Minister to the Low Countries. In October 1815 he went to Brussels to hand his credentials to the King, William I, and to be present at his coronation. Having returned to Paris a short time later to take his seat in the Chamber of Peers, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin took part during the first days of December in the debates over the trial of Maréchal Ney. He voted in favour of his condemnation, but at the same time made a formal declaration in which he stated that he thought that the Maréchal was worthy of the clemency of the king. As is well known, the clemency of the king was not accorded. About the 1st of February 1816, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin returned to The Hague to take up his duties as Minister Plenipotentiary to the Court of the Low Countries. In the month of September 1818, the Duc de Richelieu summoned Monsieur de la Tour du Pin to act as his assistant at the Congress of Aix-la-Chapelle, the object of which was to arrange the conditions for the evacuation of the French territory by the foreign troops. Immediately after the closing of this Congress, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin returned to his post at The Hague. 
At the end of the year 1819, he went again to Paris to take his seat in the Chamber of Peers at the opening of the session, and was there at the time of the assassination of the Duc de Berry, the 13th of February 1820. A little later in 1820, he was appointed ambassador at Turin, and immediately joined his post, which he did not leave until the month of January 1830 except for a sojourn of four months at Rome in 1824. In the month of January 1830, Monsieur de la Tour du decided to retire from public life, as he was worn out and also dissatisfied at the turn taken by events. He accordingly took up his residence at Versailles, where he was living at the time of the Revolution of July 1830. The 2nd of August... At three o'clock in the morning, he left Versailles and directed his steps towards Orléans, thinking that the king, in leaving by way of Rambouillet, would take this route to go to Tours. The following day, learning of the abdication of the king and of his departure for Cherbourg, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin resolved to proceed to his estate at Le Bouille, near Saint-André de Cubzac. From there, he addressed a letter to Monsieur Pasquier, president of the Chamber of Peers, in which he advised him that he was not willing to take the new oath of allegiance which was demanded of him, because it was directly contrary to that which he had already taken to Charles X. This letter was laid before the chamber during the session of the 21st of August, and appeared in the Moniteur of the following day. The events of the month of August had at the same time put an end to the mission with which Monsieur de la Tour du Pin was charged in connection with the King of Sardinia. Free, therefore, from all engagements, he passed the end of the year 1830 quietly on his estate at Le Bouille. During the course of the year 1831, his youngest son, Aymar, became involved in the movement in the Vendée and was arrested and put in prison. His father, not wishing to be separated from him, spent the four months of his detention with him. As soon as he was liberated in April 1832, Aymar again went to the Vendée to rejoin the Duchesse de Berry. The failure of this attempt is well known. After the arrest of Madame, Aymar was once more pursued, but he succeeded in finding refuge in the island of Jersey in the month of November 1832. During his absence, he was condemned to death on account of his participation in the attempt of the Duchesse de Berry. Several of the newspapers having attacked his son in terms which appeared outrageous to Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, the latter came vigorously to the defence of his son in a letter which was published in the Guienne. As a result, he was put on trial before the Cour d'Assise at Bordeaux, and the 15th of December, 1832, was condemned to pay a fine of 1,000 francs and to three months in prison. These three months, from the 20th of December 1832 to the 20th of March 1833, he was confined to the Fort du Ha, in company with his wife, who refused to be separated from him. On leaving prison, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin settled at Nice, where his wife and son came to rejoin him. Having been compelled by political reasons to leave the city, he proceeded to Turin and from there to Pignerol, where he resided until the 28th of August, 1834. At this time, urgent business interests recalled Monsieur and Madame de la Tour du Pin to France. Here they remained exactly one year, and then again left France with the plan of settling at Lausanne, where they arrived towards the end of the month of November, 1835, after a sojourn of several weeks at Suze. The 26th of February, 1837, Monsieur de la Tour du Pin died at Lausanne at the age of 78 years. The Marquise de la Tour du Pin has recounted to us in her recollections all the notable events of the period of her life comprised between her childhood and the end of the month of March, 1815. Her history from that time on was closely connected with that of her husband, whom she followed to The Hague and later to Turin. She also accompanied him to Italy and then to Switzerland in the 
voluntary exile which he imposed upon himself in order to share that of his son Emma, and she was at the bedside of her husband at Lausanne at the moment of his death in February 1837. Some time afterwards, with her son Emma, she left for Italy and took up her final residence at Pisa in Tuscany, where she died the 2nd of April, 1853, at the age of 83 years. The Marquise de la Tour du Pin had six children, three sons, Humbert, Edward and Aymar, and three daughters, Seraphine, Charlotte and Cécile. Two of her children, Seraphine and Edward, died in infancy. In the interval between March 1815, the date at which the recollections end, and the 1st of January 1820, the date at which Madame de la Tour du Pin began to write her memoirs, she lost two other children, her eldest son Humbert and her youngest daughter Cécile. Humbert de la Tour du Pin was born at Paris the 19th of May 1790. During the last years of the empire, he was sous préfet at Florence and later at Sens. At the time of the first restoration, he was appointed officer in the corps of the Mousquetaire Noir and became later aide-de-camp of Maréchal Victor, Duc de Berlin. He died under circumstances which were very sad and very dramatic. At the time of his appointment to the military household of the Duc de Berlin, among the aides de camp of the Maréchal was the Commandant Malandin, an officer who had arisen from the ranks. He was rough and uneducated, but audacious and courageous, with an open and loyal heart, but very susceptible upon the point of honour. He had won every one of his grades upon the different fields of battle of the Empire. The very day that Humbert took up for the first time his service with the Maréchal, on entering the quarters of the aides-de-camp, he encountered the Commandant Malandin. The latter addressed him in a vein of pleasantry regarding some unimportant detail of his uniform, but in terms which were coarse and unbecoming. Before Humbert could make any reply, the Maréchal entered upon a tour of inspection, and while he was there gave the Commandant a mission to the Minister of War. As soon as Humbert was able to leave, he went immediately to the hotel occupied by his family and entered the cabinet of his father. Here he recounted the incident, without omitting any of the details, except that he stated that the person involved was not himself, but one of his friends. He then asked his father what his friend ought to do. His father replied, Challenge the aggressor, and if apologies are offered, refuse them. That evening, Humbert sent a challenge to Malandin. The meeting was arranged for the following morning in the Bois de Boulogne. The weapons selected were pistols, and the distance was twenty-five paces. The duel took place the following morning in a clearing in the Bois de Boulogne. When the distance had been measured off, and the adversaries had been placed in position, before the signal had been given, the Commandant Monondin gave a sign that he wished to speak and in a loud tone he pronounced these words. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin, in the presence of these gentlemen, I think that I ought once more to declare to you that I regret my wretched pleasantry. Two good fellows ought not to kill each other for that. Humbert hesitated a moment, and then walked slowly towards the Commandant. All the assistants had a feeling of secret relief at seeing the favourable turn which the affair had taken, but when the young man arrived close to his adversary, instead of offering him his hand, he raised his arm, and with the butt of his pistol struck Malandin on the forehead. Monsieur, he said, I think that now you will not refuse to fight. After such a scene, only one denouement was possible. The signal was given. Monsieur de la Tour du Pin fired first and missed. His adversary, the commandant, then fired in turn, and shot Humbert through the heart. Cécile de la Tour du Pin was born the 13th of February 1800, under circumstances which have been related in the recollections 
at Wildeshausen, a little city upon the borders of Hanover and of the Grand Duchy of Oldenburg. During the month of September 1816 at The Hague, where Monsieur de la Tour du occupied the post of Minister Plenipotentiary of France to the Court of the Low Countries, she became the fiancée of Charles Comte de Messie Argenteau. The latter at this time had served for ten years in the French army with great distinction. He had taken part in the campaigns of the empire and had gained particular renown at the Battle of Anno, where he received the cross of the Legion of Honour. Shortly afterwards, Cécile had taken ill and in spite of every care continued to grow worse. She was ordered by her physicians to go from The Hague to Nice in order to find a milder climate, but she did not recover her health and died in that city the 20th of March, 1817, and was buried in the cemetery there. On the death of his fiancée, Comte Charles de Merciagento abandoned himself to despair. Renouncing his brilliant career in the army, he left the military service and entered into orders. He became the Archbishop of Tyre and died the 16th of November 1879 at the age of 93 years. During their residence at Turin, which has been spoken of above, Monsieur and Madame de la Tour du Pain were once more called upon to endure a new sorrow. Charlotte, the only daughter who was still living, and who had married the 20th of April 1813 at Brussels, Comte Auguste de Lidecaire Beaufort, died at the Chateau of Faublanc near Lausanne, the 1st of September 1822. At that time she was on her way from Turin to rejoin at Bern her husband, who was at that time Minister of the Low Countries near the Helvetian Republic. Charlotte left two children, a son, Adelin, born at Brussels, 11th of March, 1816, and a daughter, Cécile, born at The Hague, 24th of August, 1818. After the death of Charlotte, of the six children, Amar alone survived. On the death of the author, the manuscript of the Journal d'une femme de Saint-Quentin passed into the hands of her son, Amar, Marquis de la Tour du Pain, who had been born at Le Bouil, the 18th of October, 1806. End of postscript. End of Recollections of the Revolution and the Empire by Henriette Lucille Latour du Pain Gouvernet, edited, abridged and translated by Walter Gere.